Hello, people of the internet, and welcome to the second installment of Gundam Month here on the Kaiju Noir channel. Here I'll be discussing the first season of Mobile Suit Gundam, Iron-Blooded Orphans, here with my good friend and fellow new type pilot, Denny Roth, a.k.a. Draco Rollin. Mission accepted. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so, for those of you who probably do not follow the podcast side of my channel, Denny Roth is a friend of mine that I met at this year's G-Fest. And I have collaborated with on several projects, mostly being like the uh, Shoe Watch podcast where I interviewed him and his writing partner, uh, Declan Burke, as well as the uh, my other podcast series, Kaiju's Corner. The first episode, Denny and I discussed our grievances with the Colossal Kaiju Combat video game. And the second episode that he was on, we discussed our uh, more of our grievances, but this time with the 2017 Power Rangers films and our disappointment with the overall design, aesthetic, and artistic like, direction the film was going in. Is it grievance or nausea? T pick your poison. <laughs> so, for this episode, I or this installment of Gundam Month, I decided to bring on Denny because I figured, I realized that you know, of all the friends that I have, he's probably the only friend of mine who is perhaps as big of a Gundam fan as I am. And so I figured it would be a nice little way of him and I celebrating the most recent addition to the franchise, that being Mobile Suit Gundam Iron-Blooded Orphans. So, to quickly uh, start things off, Denny, what has been your experience or your exposure with the Gundam franchise up till now? Up till now, I think some of the... It's probably going to be for some of the people in my generation who are into the same stuff that we are. My exposure to Gundam first came with uh, Toonami's Gundam Wing and its release of that series, as well as on its midnight run where a lot of the curse words and everything else was uncensored or unchanged because... Whenever you someone says "damn," it's changed to "blast." So, damn it, blast it, or damn it, blast. Um, and then I really, I got so into it. I was so amazed. To I even did one of my introductory informative speeches for my speech class on Gundam Wing, which did not go over very well. <laughs> um, Were you like I, supposed to talk about like like politics and history? It's no, like, it's what? like this is politics. It's, it's like poli it's, no, it's fictional politics. It's politicking. No, I actually got chewed out because if anyone's familiar with, with Gundam Wing, you know that there is a Gundam model called Death Scythe Hell, which is the upgraded version uh, of Death Scythe. I got in yes. trouble for cursing because I said the character's name. Du As Duo? Full, no, Death Scythe oh, oh, Hell. Oh, Death Scythe. I said Death Scythe Hell, and I got in trouble for cursing. Oh, right. Hell used yeah. to be considered a curse word. It still kind of is, but not to the extent anymore, apparently. Um, yeah. But... I, I got really or into or it. I, a, what or what what did, what did what would uh, Dragon Ball the English uh, version of Dragon Ball Z call it H H E F I L uh, or the 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 home for infinite, infinite losers. losers yes the home for <laughs> infinite losers I only watched yeah. that because I was watching DBZ and Bridge talk about it one day it's a deep four star <laughs> that's funny um but I got so into Gundam Wing I think my first time ever, the first Gundam episode I watched I think it was like episode thirteen of Gundam Wing. Mm -hmm. I was visiting with a. F I was visiting family, and I was in a hotel room with my aunt. That's where we were staying. And I turn on the TV to kind of watch it, kind of watch Adult Swim, and I see, and I see like Cartoon Network, and see what's playing. And there's this anime with this giant mech. I'm sitting here going, "What's going on here?" So I come back home and I start watching it. So I get stuck. I started in like the first, roughly first twelve episodes. I'm missing a whole bunch, but then I start piecing together everything as the show goes on, and I watched it. If I couldn't get home by the time it was done, play by the time it was playing, I recorded it. And this got even better when Gun when Cartoon Network started doing a whole bunch more of the Gundam series. They did. Uh, they had a bunch of their Saturday runs, like their their Toonami Adult Swim runs. Well, this is pre Toonami, pre Adult Swim. They they were right. doing like. Uh, 
Gun Mobile Suit Gundam Stardust Memory. They were doing they did War in the Pocket. They did O F O eight M S team, which is one of my favorites, just because of ev- I just loved everything about it. I love the story, the characters. I'm so sad it was so short, but I loved it. I love that it ended on kind of a not a bittersweet ending, but a kind of happy. But if anyone's seen the series, they know what I mean. Yeah, it and then has I, like some some like some spark of hopefulness for the future. Yeah, but still a little bit of they didn't get through the entire thing unscathed. Exactly. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's basically Gundam in a nutshell. Right. So the next thing that they showed was G Gundam. After that, and oh my mm. lord, that is such an over the top <laughs> martial artist tournament with mechs. It is yes. above and beyond hyper over like over stimulating over-the-top madness and over-the-top story, over-the-top, like, actions and attacks and Gundams. It's about, like, as opposite from Wing as you can get, but in all the right ways. It is, but it was so good in a lot of those aspects. You know, some of the stuff did get kind of cheesy, but that's a combination of the dubbing and the way that anime films go went at the time. But it was so very good that, Mm -hmm. you know... I mean, the, I mean, speaking of dubbing, how can you go wrong when you got Mega Man X to voice Domon Kashu? Oh, hell yes. Oh, this hand of mine is burning red. I just love that. I love <laughs> the music, too. The music was just so, it was very upbeat. And it's mm-hmm. like, when you, when you see him start, like, in the second half of the season, when you start, when, after they get to the actual Hong Kong tournament, and mm-hmm. he, he gets the burning or God gun, the God or burning Gundam here in the U.S., and you just... Once you hear the music start up, you know it's bur- it's Godfinger burning finger time, and it's just freaking amazing, and it's just so high up. Actually, uh, mm-hmm. flying the sky, the first opening. Oh for yeah, it yeah, the is, theme song. Yeah, is one of my favorite songs, along with uh, the theme song from Zoid's no, uh, New Century Zero, No Future. Mm-hmm. I love those. I, I- I've yet to sing uh, "Flying the Sky" at uh, at any of my friends' uh, friends' uh, kare- uh, uh, karaoke um, parties, but I have been able to sing the original Gundam theme on, uh, on a few occasions. But one day I will be able to re- read the the read the lyrics quickly enough to one day si- care, uh, successfully sing it at, at karaoke night. <laughs> and then here is here is the other thing that the thing that kind of kept going here was. Um, after that, of course, after G Gundam, of course, they started doing the original Mobile Suit Gundam, mm-hmm. which I had never seen before. But I, in my research, N- neither did I. Yeah, I don't think anyone in the U.S. almost had at that point. Right, but because when, from what I understand, it was kind of a while Wing Gundam Wing and G Gundam, like all the other ones in between, Stardust Memory, Eighth MS Team, uh, War in the Pocket. Those were all like mini series, so. Um, Really, I guess Toonami was mostly relying on Wing and G as, like, their main draw, and they were pretty, su- really successful for the most part. But I heard that, like, when in terms of the airing of the first Gundam series, I heard it was kind of a, a bit of a commercial disappointment. There's and at that more point, to it that's than when... that. There's more okay. to it than that, because here's my memory of the events, because they started doing uh, Mobile Suit Gundam. And I was watching, I was getting kind of, I was getting invested in the characters and the stories, um, mm-hmm. The animation didn't throw me off like it probably would throw off a lot of other people who are casual anime fans because and I remember watching, watching all the 90s stuff. Right, and I was watching. I remember watching Voltron. Voltron was mm-hmm. amazing. I grew up on these on these kind of horribly animated like Hanna Barbera cartoons that shortcut animation. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Like Gundar no, the Barbarian. <laughs> right. Here's the thing, though. Mm-hmm. What happened was 9 11. Mm. Because. Gundam, Mobile Suit Gundam was being played. I think we got to like the fifteenth episode. They had just gotten they had just gotten Earth, and they were th- two or three episodes into being on Earth. And mm-hmm. then nine eleven happened. And mm-hmm. then Toonami does not play any doesn't does, does not even go with the rest of Mobile Suit Gundam. It is gone from their lineup completely. Uh huh. Because and I, yeah, at that point, the idea of realistically portrayal, realistic portrayals of war, was start, sudden, quickly started to hit very close to home. It hit exceedingly close, especially to home. when the, especially when the beginning of Gundam starts off with a terrorist attack with a, when the when the Zeon forces drop a, a giant a colony on a, a on an Earth planet on an Earth city. Right. So. 9-11 and, and the fallout from 9-11 really impacted the show's run to the point where 
And I was waiting because I figured, you know, out of respect for what was happening, that Toonami and Cartoon Network were, were going to pull the show for a while. Mm -hmm. Throughout the rest of my high school experience, it never came back. Mm -hmm. And that was my mm -hmm. sophomore year in high school. Mm -hmm. I'm very glad that we have this uh, age gap between you and I because I was too young to be aware of, like, the, uh, com the uh, commercial politics behind uh, the airing of Gundam in the West. But, uh, yeah, I'm very glad to have been able to, I'm able to understand what was going on through your eyes, through your perspective. Right, because I, I remember, because a lot of people will say, I, where were you on 9-11? Well, I know where I was, and I remember that day very well. But mm -hmm. I remember also, I remember everything about that day pretty much, pretty good detail. My classes I took, uh, mm -hmm. the, watching the news events, like we were gathered in the library watching stuff, but anyway, I'm getting off topic. But I do remember when I came home, that Gundam mm -hmm. wasn't on, and I wasn't actually, I wasn't upset, because mm -hmm. after watching Gundam Wing, War in the Pocket, Stardust Memory, uh, 08th MS Team, I realized that Gundam at its core is basically a war drama, so you really can't yeah. have that pull. I'm like, oh, they pulled G Gundam. That was, or they, they pulled Mobile Suit Gundam. That's probably a good move. So mm -hmm. I wasn't upset at them for pulling for pulling uh, Mobile Suit Gundam. It actually probably was one of the be was a really good decision at the time. Okay, so mm -hmm. we we fast forward. And I don't I don't get back into Gundam for quite a while until because uh, the next time they start showing anything Gundam was back in two thousand four with Gundam Seed. Now was Gundam Seed on the Sci Fi Channel or on on Cartoon Network slash Adult Swim? It was because I never saw Gundam Seed. Gundam Seed was on Cartoon Network. Really? Gundam Seed was okay. on Cartoon Network along with Scryd, which is also really great anime. Also, mm -hmm. one of my favorite songs, Reckless Fire. It's amazing. It's six minutes long, and it is amazing. Sorry, off top. Um. <laughs> so, but with uh, in in the in the in the aspect of Gundam, so I'm watching Gundam Seed, and I get through most of the series, and. This is a th I can't remember. I can't remember much. of The series has been so long, but it was like, oh, it's a Gundam series. I kind of got bored with it part of the way, but I kept watching mm -hmm. it, and I realized mm -hmm. that one of the girls is just a bitch, and she's a manipulative one too, and that ticked me off to no end. I'm like, die, someone kill her, <laughs> please die. Now, which one do you? How which one do you hate more, her or Relina Peacecraft? I actually don't mind Relina Peacecraft. She annoys me. She annoys mm -hmm. me in some aspects, but I understand where she's coming from. So I can't really fault mm -hmm. her too much. But mm -hmm. for me, really, Peacecraft was not the most annoying thing about Gundam Wing. It, she was mm -hmm. not She was not an annoying thing about Gundam Wing. I was actually rooting for her and Hero as a couple the entire time. Because hmm. um, I did All see right. her. I did see Relina grow from this idealistic, naive girl into kind of this more straightforward politician with strong convictions. So I saw that transformation, mm -hmm. that growth, and I really appreciated that. Mm -hmm. Even though which, Relina, we will which, which we will also see later in this review. We will also go over that. Um, mm -hmm. The next series after that, I didn't see on any of the Cartoon Network series or shows. It was actually uh, Gundam Build Fighters. Oh, nice. On YouTube? On YouTube, on Gundam Intro. I'll give them a shout out because they have a buttload of Gundam shows on there. A lot yeah. of the more recent For stuff. For whatever reason, a lot of their videos do not play in Japan nor in America. I'm not sure if you've been able to test any of the episodes on your end because oh, outside of I've the been, build, outside I, of, mm -hmm. I, I'll to answer your question. I actually watched all of Gundam Build Fighters or all of Gundam Build Fighters more about uh -huh. two thirds of Gundam Build Fighters try before I stopped keeping up with it because I was going back every week for a new episode update. Mm -hmm. And I actually watched. I've actually been watching some of the some of the continuation of Iron Blood Orphans. The subtitle. Okay. Version. So that those are up yeah. there. I have not had a problem with the videos not loading for me here in the US. Okay. Build Fighters I was able to watch. Build Fighters Try I also watched. Um, but it, everything else always gave me problems, issues. However, maybe if I were to go back to America, at the time of recording, I plan on going back to my hometown in America for the holiday. So when I go there, I'll check back and uh, look at any videos that see if they work. Because for whatever reason, a lot of other videos... Ha, were giving me problems both in the states and in Japan. I I don't know why for the, that is the case because I know like Gundam Info they put out episodes in every single language. for the subtitles for every single language. Yeah, yeah, for the Asian and English markets. And 
um, all of them are were the majority of those videos from of other languages were blocked in both America and Japan. Right. I will say this: it really got me into Build Fighter. I got really got into Build Fighters because of the story, and of course mm-hmm. the idea of yeah, the fighting it, tournament. It's a show, yeah, it's a show about Gundam fans for Gundam fans. Right, and they make references and callbacks to a whole bunch of stuff. Um, I really mm-hmm. kind of like the science fiction aspect of the story. I thought was actually really yeah. interesting. They they touched it lightly, but then ended it on a really they ended it kind of without answering a lot of questions. But at the same time, yeah, yeah. I think it's it like fits better tr- that way. <laughs> yeah, it's like don't ask too many questions about how don't. this this Gundam models brought to life technology works. It's like, not how not to you, how, not how to does mention the battle the- system. <laughs> how does the battle system recognize original weaponry? Don't ask that question. Just don't ask up. the question, and don't even start asking about how the hell the guy dimension hops anyways but the couples made it out and i was happy for that and i love that part um <laughs> i really love gundam build fighters try because mm-hmm. it's a hall it's a hall it's a callback to g gundam because mm-hmm. the main character's gi has the burning hand symbol on his chest <laughs> and uh-huh. his his gundam is the burning gun is a is a newer model of the burning gundam which yeah, is customized amazing. burning Gundam. <laughs> yes. Oh, it's so cool. Um, mm-hmm. And then after that, I've I've had an interesting Gundam. So I've had like I have a bunch of the models, some of the toys. I have a wing custom, or a I think it's a probably the endless waltz version. Yeah, endless waltz version. Uh, wing zero uh, custom. I've got the wing zero from the anime on a one fifty two scale. The one I have mm-hmm. here is a one thirty second scale. And of mm-hmm. course, I had a I have a whole bunch of the toys. And I got more toys from a friend of mine. Mm-hmm. who got them from her, whose ex left them, so she gave them to me. So I have a giant box full of Gundam stuff, like all uh, like a, a catch grab of everything from all the series. Cool, cool. And of course, I go so, to... So, uh, just... Mm-hmm. I, uh, just one more thing. I go to local toys, I go to local toy, show, toy shows, and they have Gundams, and I'm just kind of staring at them going, I want so bad. <laughs> I want all the Gundams. I want all the Gundams. All the Gundam. <laughs> Gundam me, so, bro. Um, Hmm. Uh, just wondering, uh, outside of the original series, which you were able to catch on Cartoon Network, were you able to check out any of the, um, the past, like, classic era of Gundam, like, between Wing and the original? Um, aside from the miniseries, not much. Mm-hmm. I think those miniseries are much later in production, if I remember correctly. Um, I uh, did I go think through... They were... Mm-hmm. Um, I think they were like late '80s, early '90s. So they were those those the OVA, the miniseries OVAs. Those were definitely before Wing. Yeah, definitely before Wing. Um, the one the one thing I do want to mention is that since we did, since I did not finish Mobile Suit Gundam mm-hmm. back be, during uh, 2001 with 9/11, I went back and actually looked for them all on YouTube to watch the entire series all in one. Oh, nice! So I actually managed to watch the entire series of Mobile Suit Gundam. So I actually have a better inkling for the story. Um, cool, cool. So yeah, aside so, from Mobile mm-hmm. Suit Gundam, Gundam Wing, and G Gundam, and now the Build Fighters trilogy, the Build Fighters uh, series, and the first season of Barbato of Iron Blood Orphans of Barbatos, mm-hmm. I've watched uh, was it O eight MS Team War in the Pocket and uh Double Zero Eighty Three Stardust Memory. Mm-hmm. Those mini series I've watched. Those are the ones I've oh. watched in between. So I haven't watched uh, Shar's Counter Attack. I have watched mm-hmm. a lot of the 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 Zeta Gundam, uh, mm-hmm. oh yeah, Gundam Seed. I have not seen Seed Destiny. Mm-hmm. Although I've off, I every time I re- I look on any, I look for anyone's opinions on that. Like whenever I try to gauge the pub, like the general opinion from the Gundam fan base, De- Seed Destiny seems to be one of the uh, low points of the franchise. At least I, that's what that that's the vibe that I always get. Yeah, it's Gundam Seed Destiny. That's right. Um, I I don't think Cartoon Network played it at all, to be honest. Like I think after Destiny okay. was done, they didn't play that. That's... I don't know for certain. Uh, mm-hmm. I I got forced to move at the time that was playing, so I kind of lost cable mm-hmm. for a while, and then my entire schedule mm-hmm. got shifted around, so I couldn't keep up with it at that point. I should try and go back and watch it sometime. I just need to find okay. a good venue that it's going to be accessible. Yeah. Okay, I'm surprised that the Cartoon Network never went ahead with that because it looked like Seed was a very popular sub franchise within the Gundam. It was right, and with I, the Gundam series because I guess like for many people that was their first that was like the first Gundam that many that a new generation of fans were exposed to for the 2000s and in every like Gundam related um, video game or every single piece of Gundam related merchandise Seed 
uh, or at least the mobile suits from Seed always get a lot of representation. There's also a bit of, of love for the fans. Cause I've done a co- I've done a commission where um, the characters from from Gundam Seed, like the four main characters, whose mm-hmm. names escape me for the life of me. I know what they look like, and I point them out, but I can't name them for the life of me. Um, I know. Are, I only know the protagonist, Kira Yamato, right? Yeah, Kira. Um, there's the pink-haired princess, the blonde-haired revolutionary, and then the the Xeon knockoff of the other guy. I can't remember his name. The, dark, the black-haired boy, right? Yeah. Okay. So moving forward, uh, I like you. I also did a lot. I also watched. Uh, I, I grew up watching mostly Wing and G Gundam. Uh, for I pretty much had like the same experiences that you did, and I lo- fell in love with Gundam for the same reasons that you did as well. And um, I loved the politics of Wing. I loved the uh, intricate uh, character dynamics, and I loved the action, loved the mo- the robots. And of course, with G, I just loved the over the top action. It was like Dragon Ball Z beat Street Fighter with giant robots. And um, eventually, in high school, I went back and searched, scoured the internet for more Gundam, and that's how I was able, I was able to watch uh, like Turn A, Double A, um, Turn uh, Turn A, X, Gundam X, um, uh, all the OVAs that I missed out that you were able to catch on Cartoon Network. And uh, in college, I was able to look through the uh, classic age of Gundam through the original Zeta, Double Zeta, um, currently on Victory. And on television, I was able to get back into Gundam, I think, in, see, yeah, it was in high school with Double O on the Sci-Fi Channel. Uh, but Seed, I never, like I said, I never was, I never caught Seed on television and still have not seen any of the Seed sub-franchise to this day. And like you, I also saw the Build Fighters and Build Fighters Try on YouTube. Uh, I hear that there's a, 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 like a sequel to Build Fighters Try called Build Fighters Try Island Paradise or Island something. I guess it's like some, a, why does a it sound, why does series? it sound like a bad da- dating sim? It sounds like a bad oh. dating sim. But oh, no, I'm, no, if it is good, good. I want it. I want. A, I want a third season of of of, Gun, of Gunpla. I really do. I loved it. it yeah, it, it spoke uh, to me on a level because I liked building models like the Zoids models oh, and some of the Gundam models. Gun- I like building. Those. Sorry, uh, Gundam Build Fighters. Uh, Gundam Build Fighters Try Island Wars, and Island it was Wars. I guess like a like a one episode special. I think. Oh, maybe. It's just like a, it was not meant to be a season. It was just meant to be like a, a short little here's a little bonus to like follow up. Mm-hmm. Oh, it was a TV special. It was a TV uh, special from August 21st of this year. So, mo, uh, moving on to the latest uh, Gundam project, at least the latest televised Gundam project, because Lord knows that there's a lot going on with Gundam right now with the Gundam origin movies. Um, there's the Gundam uh, Thunderbolt web series that was compiled into another theatrical movie. And, but for now, just for the latest televised series, we have Gu- Mobile Suit Gundam Iron-Blooded Orphans. So how, were, how did you first come across, uh, how did you came across uh, Iron-Blooded Orphans, Denny? We were actually watching Adult Swim. From my roommate and I, we usually have to record TV because he works nights, and sometimes I work nights. But I also work during the day, so we kind of have to record shows where he's at work or he has to sleep before he goes to work, so he misses them. Um, mm-hmm. So we were watching on, on a whim. We were just kind of watching like Family Guy or American Dad, something on, on Toonami or on Adult Swim. And then we see an advertisement for a new anime show. I'm sitting there watching this going, okay, new anime show. Let's see what this is. And like it builds up the suspense of like these worker kids that are downtrodden, beaten, they're slaves, and they paint the story as if they're trying to defend themselves at this base from this mm-hmm. stuff. And they they do this with a legend, and they mention it with a legend with a legendary mobile suit Gundam. I'm like, ah, it's a Gundam <laughs> series. <laughs> oh, dude, really cool. <laughs> What's really cool is that um it, within that very um promo they recite the narrator of that promo recited the same line they um that the that peter cullen recited when he did the promo for, for the gundam first wing. promo for gundam wing yeah like the latest chapter in the most epic anime saga of all time and i was like Mobile oh snap suit. he said it <laughs> oh snap you know when optimus prime you know a, you know a robot is is awesome when optimus prime is telling you how awesome it is Yes. <laughs> if Gundam, uh, it's official. In America, Gundam has Optimus Prime seal of approval. Of course it does. It has to. If so does Voltron. So does Voltron. Absolutely. That is true. Absol- that is absolutely. true. That is the, that is the trifecta right there. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, 
I guess for me, uh, I guess for so for you, you were introduced to Gun. You were first aware of Gundam um, Iron Blooded Orphans, or I guess like just to make it short, would you prefer to call it Gundam IBO? I always want to call it God uh, Gundam Barbatos because that's the Gundam frame <laughs> that we hardly hear about in, as per name for a right. good portion of the series. Um, I think. Yeah. Um, so I guess for, uh, for we can call it IBO, orphans, it's, it's fine. IBO. Yeah. Okay. I, usually in text form, I would say that I would just type that oh, out. Yeah. Um, but yeah, for Gundam IBO, I saw, um, uh, I first became aware of it through, uh, it was actually through a news article on Facebook. I was, when it was, the TV series was first announced and it was coming to Japan. And eventually I found out through an episode of JonTron that, uh, when he was pimping out uh, Crunchyroll, his sponsor, Crunchyroll, I, I, did I realize, oh, snap, it's uh, Gundam Iron-Blooded Orphans is already available on Crunchyroll. And so I was able to get myself an account, and I was able to catch and up on the, the Japanese airing and the money. Actually, it was like a free month, I believe. Oh, it was a free month. Um, yeah, one free month of, of Crunchyroll. And then I think I paid for like a couple months before I ended up deleting it uh, because Crunchyroll sadly does not work in Japan. Yeah. Uh, for obvious reasons, because Crunchyroll is meant for an American audience. Because in in Japan, most pe- majority of people here don't stream. I mean, they're barely getting on the Netflix bandwagon, and even to a limited degree. So anyways, um, I was able to catch up on... All actually, all of Iron Blooded Orphans, uh, week by week, and it, I felt like a little kid again, just like watching it on Toonami, just like, oh boy, I'm waiting for it. Um, in a way, it was kind of like sim- it was similar to when I was watching Iron uh, Gundam Double O on uh, Sci-Fi Channel, because at that point I was in high school and I could then be old enough to comprehend all of the story that was going on. And surprisingly enough, just like uh, Gundam Double O and Gundam Build Fighters, this is a 25 episode season rather than a long ass 50 episode uh, saga of a, of a show. And so I'm wondering, I, I'm very, very surprised that like they're finally, like a lot of shows are going through the season um, approach when it comes to anime. And. Uh, maybe it could be because of the limitations when it comes to Japanese shows. Maybe they can't afford to make 50-episode shows anymore. So it's like, okay, let's just do one season. Let's see how it does. And then l- if it's popular enough, we'll continue forward. I guess they're kind of going through the American route nowadays. Well, that uh, that might be money-saving effort. I think the last full... Well, the thing is, um, to put it in comparison, I think some reason they go with seasons is because it, they're not they don't know whether or not the anime version of the manga that they're producing, because right. in Japan, the process is the manga is created, it generates enough interest that it then gets gets promoted uh, to anime as well. Right, I and part- uh, considering that like the last three, outside of the Build Fighters uh, subs franchise, the last three Gundam shows have actually been, uh, let's see, has it, was it three or two? Because I know like Gundam Age was a disappointment, Gundam Reconquista in G was another disappointment. Uh, so at this point, I think they were really like more hesitant because, like, yeah, Gundam Reconquista in G that was only twenty six episodes and nothing more than that. And for Gundam Age, Gundam Age was a full series, but the the reception was was rather poor, and the sales of the Gun Plus were very were at like almost at an all time low. Here's the other thing to, to kind of give it comparison to another anime. I, I think part of the reason they may be doing that because the way Gundam Gundam works is that it, it's been an it's been a war drama anime. I think they didn't really have a manga adaptation, or wasn't mm-hmm. didn't start off as a manga. I, actually, it, was, it got it adapted right. into a manga. Um, mm-hmm. Right, right. It was adapted into a manga, and ironically, that manga is now being adapted to the origin movie. What if you freaking do? Um, <laughs> it's like it's like Negima all over again. Um, but I, I kind of I it's, think it's like I, poetry. It rhymes, right? Here's the thing I think might be might be part of this is another anime series your fans may be aware of is Full Metal Alchemist because there are two mm-hmm. full series of Full Metal Alchemist. You have the first series that aired in 2004, 2005. This is all like it was Full Metal Alchemist, uh, Scryd, and Gundam Seed that I watched on the Toonami Action Block, whatever it was, uh, on that Saturday. Mm-hmm. Uh, during that, during those years, um, but the thing with Full Metal Alchemist is it stayed very close to the manga until it started getting caught up to the point where it surpassed the manga and then diverged to its own thing. And then you've mm-hmm. got Brotherhood, 
which is a which is a much much closer adaptation of it, pretty much almost down to the letter, except for stuff that the first season already covered, so that they're not retreading the same stuff. Um, the thing here is is that I think that disconnect because I don't think fans fans' reactions to the first Full Metal Alchemist movie are rather poor because it mm-hmm. diverged too far from the manga, but then they love Brotherhood because it is almost a blatant retelling of everything in the manga. The one thing I want to try and bring this up is to tie this into is because of the surpassing. Let's let's bring up in this as an, as an as an example of what I think the industry is looking towards right now for their series, uh, based on manga and maybe affecting their other animated shows too that have no basis on a manga origins but are just treading the waters instead of putting all the money for a full fifty point season. They have the mm-hmm. they have the short little you know. They have the short little little littler seasons, um, as 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 part of a two part series. Mm-hmm. Attack on Titan. Oh yeah. Attack on Titan is right now about sixty five to seventy chapters long. The first season of first twenty four twenty five episodes covers roughly the first the first twenty four to twenty five chapters. So, in that aspect, they stopped production on Attack on Titan and let the manga continue. Because the manga is produced monthly. It's not like a lot of these other shows that are, like, Shonen Jump is produced more often than not on a weekly basis, as opposed to a monthly yeah. basis. But Attack Which on I Titan is incredibly a- nightmarish for those poor writers and artists. Yes, it is. It is a very, very demanding job. And when we especially get to Attack on Titan, um, it's a monthly series. It's not a weekly series like others. It is a monthly series. So it Mm -hmm. takes longer to get that stuff adapted. And of course, Mm -hmm. each chapter is like 60 pages long. It's a long series. Mm -hmm. So at that instance, I think part of the reason they did that, because I think they might, as long as Attack on Titan goes, they'll probably just adapt 24, 25 chapters into into a season find a good cutoff point and call that season two or season three or season mm-hmm. four, however long it goes, because I think they're bending more to the fans in that the fans are the fans. There's a lot of fan backlash when it, when it diverges. Here's another example. Holic. It's, I call it triple X Holic because it's X, X, X Holic. Mm. Um, it's done by clamp. It's one of their other longer running series along with, uh, Subasa or Subasi, I think. They kind of acts as a they're they're combining all their universes together and tying stuff like Chobits and Magic Knight Ray Earth and Card Captor Sakura. All the all the productions that Clamp has done are kind of being tied together in the in the Subasi in the Subasi series and Holic as well. Um, they even had a major crossover event between the two of them at that point. But Holic, the animated series, the anime series only lasted twenty five uh, episodes. Same thing with Oran High Host Club, 25 episodes. What is effectively a season, or was effectively a season of a series, or is 25 episodes, and that's it. No more are being produced or being made beyond that. Mm-hmm. Even though the comic, even though the comics, manga, they're based on mm-hmm. are still continuing. This mm-hmm. was the so issue like I the had season with, is just like an advertisement for the manga or for almost, the original source material. Almost at this point, I think it is. They do kind of try to end them, but they end them very abruptly, and it mm-hmm. kind of causes a bit of disconnect. Uh, well, I another, guess it, like it, it, they, I'm assuming they end in like an open. They have like an open an open ending where like this is the end of one chapter, but you can imagine further store further adventures in your head. Pretty much. I mean, Hulk ended like that. Or High Host Club almost ended like that. On that note, um, another one that ended like that, but it also followed the manga's ending because I think the manga ours got the manga got short got shorted was Bosu Rinkin. Or as it, the translation was Arms Alchemy. Uh, was done by the creator of Rurouni Kenshin. But due to the poor performance of the com- of the manga due to the way Japan does its publishing, they had to cut it out really, really abruptly, and they had to end it. But they gave the author at least a chance to do a very long uh, chapter to resolve everything. And mm-hmm. Bosu Renkin is not that long of a series, which is the other thing. Um, mm-hmm. 
But I think okay. I think uh, that's that's part of the whole thing is that you do for these seasons. Like if the anime series the anime series doesn't do very well, they start cutting it off. Yeah. So I guess now these seasons are just like to test the waters. I guess um, instead of just pulling putting putting all their uh, like uh, what do you call it like betting everything on black putting putting all your eggs and, in one basket. Yeah, putting all, eggs all those all those other funny things of don't take big risks. You don't yeah. know what's going to uh, happen, Johnny. So do you think? Going the seasonal route works in favor for Iron Blooded Orphans because for Iron Blooded Orphans, it almost tells kind of like a, a very rather complete story where if even if there never was a season two, for me personally, I think I'd probably feel a bit satisfied with what we have here. What do you think? At the the, the thing about the first twenty five episodes after I, and now for your for your fans here, I, I watched most of the series on Toonami. They did mm-hmm. not play the first episode here. It was a Rick and oh, Morty really? show that they were that they showed instead in the time slot, which ticked me off no end. What the? F- because the week after, guess what we got? We got the second episode because of the kind of controversial nature of because because the thing with 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 IBO oh, right. is it does hit close to home in a mo- in our modern world here. Um, because we do. Oh need yeah, to especially especially not- after this recent like when I was rewatching the series like like this past um like actually last week I was rewatching the series the English dub just so I can get a good a grasp of both versions and now after the Trump election looking at everything uh, that's been going on in the world and looking at this TV show I was like wow this really you're right this does hit close to home I'm not talking about the election that's the, that's the no least but part. yeah it's like it's like after there, that there are, it the helped me with be the aware series of more that stuff. I think everyone can understand and appreciate is that mm-hmm. is a war drama that does touch on social political issues, child yeah. soldiers, um, mm-hmm. military might, um, territory rights, territorial rights of, of, of countries, mm-hmm. um, independence uh, what was from it? a larger like, n- Oh, Neocolonialism, Neo-colonialism. Where instead of like simply instead of it simply taking over a, a, a instead of taking over someone else's land, you're just a uh, Taking control of its resources and leaving the other, leaving the inhabitants, you left them there to to die or left right. them there to starve or to suffer because of what the stuff that they need that you are taking away from them. So, so Toonami didn't run the original, the very first, ep- the very first uh, episode of IBO. Um, I had to watch that tonight mm-hmm. before we did this recording here. Um, okay. And the thing is, Toonami also is not done with the run with the with the American dub. So I think we have like two to three more episodes to go. Well, I think mm-hmm. we have one more episode to go, and that's next week. And right. that's going to be the last episode. Yeah, that should be the last episode. Yeah. Um, I yeah, have some right. problems with that. We'll get to the we'll get to, into the show a little bit more, and I'll kind of discuss some of my problems mm-hmm. I had with uh with that up at that point. But okay. Um. So far, everything's been running pretty smoothly here, and I've been able to catch up and able to see the full season. I saw the Japanese tw- the, the 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 English subtitled for the twenty fifth episode. I saw mm-hmm. that tonight as well. So mm-hmm. same for me, since yeah, the English version of the last episode of season one has yet to be aired. Uh, okay, so basically to give a rundown of the uh, basic pl- uh, basic plot rundown of Gundam IBO, uh, basically this is another continuity. And keep in mind that for anyone who is like maybe a casual Gundam fan, um, for the ever since I want to say nineteen ninety four, every televised Gundam show would take place in its own separate continuity, and any time they would go back to the original. Uh, continuity that started it all. It's usually in the form of uh, an OVA series. So yeah, Gundam IBO is an, yet another uh, continuity, and in this continuity, it takes place in the far flung future where people have uh, humanity has now lived in space colonies and on Mars, which is uh, I believe new for the franchise. And at some point in this version of Earth's history, there was a big war that occurred 300 years prior to the events of this show called the Calamity War. And after the events of the Calamity War, this big military organization called Gallerhorn began taking over certain, uh, the majority of the economy on Earth. Um, and the Earth con- uh, government, as a result of Gallerhorn's uh, control, now have control over the metal resources on Mars. And so Mars is pretty much like a lot of people live in poverty and they're wishing for economic independence so that they can be able to, uh, they would be able to, uh, prosper. 
And there, uh, this is when we bring in Cudelia Ina Bernstein. She is a political activist. She strives for the independence of Mars, and she needs to transport, get herself transported from Mars to Earth, so that she can get, bring, take the full, uh, political fight to her opponents, because she believes she has an uh, ally on a uh, political ally on Mars that could help her uh, achieve her goals. Unfortunately, Gallerhorn won't Gallerhorn won't let that happen. So she needed needs the help of a uh, basically like a private a privateer a private bodyguard military service. Uh, I forgot what the technical term was, but essentially this uh, new team, which was which um, forms, uh, kind of like breaks down and then reforms over the course of the first two or three episodes, is rebranded as Tegadon, led by uh, a series led by the titular Iron Blooded Orphans. These are orphans who have no education, no um, opportunities to live a normal life. These are people, uh, people who have uh, children who have been uh, t- children and teenagers and young adults who have all been abandoned by society and having this very dangerous, horrible job. This is like their only means of living, their only means of survival. And for and some so, of them, they're slaves. They're forced into it. That's the other thing uh, that's also important about yes. this is. The show make and it also makes it also makes a big deal about this because there's a number that are called human debris. They're slaves. Yes, they are less mm-hmm. than people. So another thing that comes but, across yeah. in this entire uh, organization, this entire this entire future, and this is not just on Mars either. It's in the colonies. It's on mm-hmm. Earth. It's if you are captured and sold into slavery, you are pretty much done for. And you're, and especially yeah. on Mars, you're forced to work in these, they're military companies. Mm-hmm. If what I remember right. right. There's yeah. numerous, there's numbers of them all over the place. Almost um, like, like privatized militias, I guess. It's like, you need, you need, you need to hire some guns. They're like, they're hired guns, essentially. Mm-hmm. And so, um, eventually, t- uh, she, uh, Cadelia Ina Bernstein, she t- decides to hire Tekadon to help transport her from Earth to, uh, from Mars to Earth and meeting along several, uh, enemies and allies along the way, be it the space pirates or space gangsters or space military. And eventually, it, co- it, um, the whole season, uh, finishes with one last battle against the forces of Gallerhorn, uh, once they reach Earth. So, what are your overall thoughts of this story in terms of, like, the world, its setting, um, like, the structure, the pacing, all that kind of stuff? I do believe that you are correct in that this is a first for the Gundam series to be placed outside of, basically, the Earth's sphere. Mm-hmm. I do want to bring, uh, bring a little uh, piece of trivia. Um, I, I, As far as I know, Mars has never been... Uh, source of uh, has never been a place that has been referenced except maybe in Gundam Age because even though I haven't re- seen Gundam Age from what I understand the uh, antagonists of Gundam Age were the descendants of a failed um, group of explorers that attempted to colonize Mars. The last time Mars was possibly brought up was that after it was originally planned that after Gu- Victory Gundam back in 1993, um, Yoshiyuki Tomino, the creator of Gundam, he wanted to make another series that focused on colonists on Mars. Unfortunately, he and um, Sunrise went left went their separate ways after Bandai purchased Sunrise and Gundam. So at that point, they kind of scrapped the idea of a Mars-based colony and decided to go with alternate universes, starting with G Gundam. So I think I, 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 I will say correct maybe you it's... one okay. thing. Mars was mentioned as a potential place to colonize at the end of Gundam Wing Endless Waltz when um, Zex Marquis and uh, his second in command, who's always mm-hmm. Noin, Noin, when Lieutenant Noin are leaving Earth for Mars to help in the mm. colonization process. Okay, thank you very much. So it looks like Mars has uh, has been teased here and there throughout the franchise's history, but I think this might be our first time where we have a full-on, fully-fledged civilization, so a uh, fully uh, realized colonization of Mars in the franchise. Right, and um, trying to organize my thoughts on this is a little bit difficult because there's a, there's a lot that goes on um, in the series mm-hmm. to characters and everything else. Um. But the one thing that comes across here is I love the fact that they've taken the idea of space travel 
and expanding from the colonies around the Earth sphere to also include the Mars sphere in this aspect. Mm -hmm. Um, And in that aspect of, and this kind of almost mimics to an extent, you could argue any kind of revolution in the history of the, in the history of the world because when you have people going to colonize another land not even not not even dealing with the natives but you have the the colonists going to colonize another land the mm-hmm. monarchy or the parliament or the 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 republic mm-hmm. still gets control over that mm-hmm. um so it's kind of in a way still mimics almost every gundam series in that it's overall Part, its overall kind of theme is revolution mm-hmm. and independence. Right. Even like the original Gundam series, it focused on revolution and independence when it came to the Principality of Zeon and their strive for independence uh, against the Earth Federation. And the same thing uh, you can also bring up for Gundam Wing, where like, uh, almost actually like, like Gundam Wing, Iron Blighted Orphans m- wants to make you root for the colonists' side. Um, as opposed to the Earth government, and that's kind of the other. That's kind of the other neat thing here is that it keeps that kind of tone of, you know, this is this is a war for our independence and our individuality. Yes, we are still humans, but we identify as Martians, and we're Martians. And a lot of them, and there's a lot of what I would determine as spacism or planetism. Mm-hmm. They're mm-hmm. born in space. They're space rats, which is an insult that is thrown around uh, constantly yes. in the English dub. Um, Not only is there a lot of prejudice towards um, the "quote unquote" space rats in this uh, uni- in this society, in this universe, there's also a large amount of prejudice towards cyber enhancements, which is kind of which is really which is really a double edged kind of thing here, um, because mm-hmm. they're they're in this universe. There's a a uh, cyber enhancement called the Vignana Vignana system, and I'm uh, uh, butchering uh, Ale- that. Alea Ale- 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 Vignana. Alea um system that basically interacts with the, with the person's neural spine and neural system. It allows mm-hmm. them better control with a mobile suit. And there are a couple different mobile suits. Mm-hmm. The more common ones are these little kind of small legged tanks ah, that uh, they're mobile called mobile workers. workers. Yes. And, yes, mobile workers. And these are used primarily as fodder, as transportation, not transportation, but, like, moving uh, materials. Like bulldozers, like construction vehicles. Right, but they also have weapons and other enhancements, because remember, there's a whole bunch of these, uh, there there are several of these military uh, bases, these military companies Mm -hmm. that exist on Mars and throughout, throughout some parts of the Earth's sphere even further out. And I think even they referenced that Jupiter also might have some inhabitants sit and might have some uh. colonization on their moons because uh-huh. Tewaz is based on Jupiter. This is where their main base mm-hmm. of operations is, if I remember right. Um, and Tewaz is a big co- uh, corporation that kind of works on both sides of the law in terms of spreading its influence in space. Because it, it I would, I would say Tewaz is exactly kind of, are the, they're mobsters. They are yeah, monsters. yeah. It's like a, it's with a, like a, a very cross between like a Japanese and Italian culture mix, right? So, but what I do and and with okay, to go back to the original point because I got off topic a little bit was with the racism, mm-hmm. kind of, with the spacism kind of thing. They're space mm-hmm. rats, and the technology that is kind of cybernetic enhancements are frowned upon, or they're viewed as mm-hmm. disturbing because no one in the Earth, no one in the Earth sphere does anything with it, but the Calamity Wars, it was common, and it was the only way to really pilot mm-hmm. the Gundam units. Right, because these... in, un- in this universe, the Gundams were a series of mobile suits that were used 300 years prior in the Calamity War, and as far as we know, there are there used to be 72 Gundams, and uh, we witnessed three of them in this season alone. Right. And, um, What's also really interesting is that Gallerhorn, after they won the war, they even though they themselves used cyber enhancements such as the Alea Vignana system, uh, they actually try to like uh, turn the tables and ban the use of of uh, cyber enhancements, or like they they detest they want to like they made their their the new society detest cyber enhancements so as to discourage their enemies from using it against their own creation against them. 
the the funny thing that backfires about that is that on Mars, the mobile on Mars, these these children. This is the other thing. It's it's children slavery, children workers, mm-hmm. children soldiers. Um, mm-hmm. the the system, the uh, I can't say it. <laughs> oh, the Leia Vignana. The Leia Vignana system can only really be installed if you're at a very young age and still developing. Uh huh. Most of them, a, a good portion of the main cast has the system, and even some of them are smaller children. They're forced with the system implanted by the companies that get a hold of them, either through slavery, recruitment, what have you, mm-hmm. if you can get because this. That's, and, that, that's because that's the only way they can be quote-unquote useful. Right. And again, this this hits on a lot of real-world issues with child soldiers, how useful you are, um, mm-hmm. child labor... And, and, and slavery to an extent, to, to a very large extent, to where there's a couple characters who are slaves make a big deal about it. Um, mm-hmm. because they were captured and turned, they were captured and turned to slaves here. Um, I think it sets up a really good start for that dynamic because it almost, I want to say it mirrors the, the American independence revolutionary movement because, because mm-hmm. the earth would be like, would be closer to England in this instance and you have, you know, um, the, the colonies, uh, wanting their own independence as their own unity. In this in this case, the colony itself is an entire planet with resources mm-hmm. that the Earth sphere wants and uses, mm-hmm. and uses its, influ- its influence to get, grab, and take. Um, I think I, I I definitely agree with that. Um, another sort of real life parallel I kind of thought of as well was back in I want to say the eighties. Or the seventies. I'm really bad with my history. I apologize for this, but there was a period of time where America was control had control over um, Iran's um, economy, where they even went so far as to replace the leader of Iran and put a figurehead there, so that the figurehead would allow America to take advantage of its resources. And eventually, this led to an entire backlash of revolution, backlash against American culture. Uh, or against the Ameri- uh, American government, and from there spread the seed of kind of like anti-Western hate amongst the Middle East. I believe it's kind of like uh, it, kind of like the events that were depicted in Argo, a little to a li- to a limited degree. Mm-hmm. Um, but overall, the world they build is actually pretty intricate and very politically driven. I think, which is which is interesting on a couple different levels because. We're introduced to this larger world because it, it expands you out. Because as they leave Mars, we find out more about Galahorn, its role within the yeah. entire Earth sphere. Um, the yeah. four economic blocks are interesting because mm-hmm. it, it divides up the countries in a way that's almost re- reminiscent of uh, Code Gaia's uh, Lelouch's revolution. Mm-hmm. Um, in the uh, way that stuff's broken down in different areas on the on the continents, and it breaks down all the continents and their economic regions from seven down to four, mm-hmm. which I thought was which I thought was really kind of an interesting take on that build up on that setup for what the world for what the Earth politics are like. Because sometimes the Earth politics, other than the Earth Federation forces, whatever they're called in whatever iteration are really mm-hmm. the only explanation you get for how the political backdrop, what the political backdrop of the world is. Uh, mm-hmm. Exception to this may be G Gundam, but G Gundam's done in a completely different way anyways. Right. <laughs> it kind of takes, like, the the building blocks of Gundam and kind of threw them out the window to do its own thing. Right. Uh, so, let's see. I guess moving on ahead, uh, what do you think of the overall, like, uh, pacing of this season? Because I noticed that on my second viewing, uh, I noticed that there was a lot of episodes dedicated to downtime, where you would have maybe like one, two, one or two episodes of intense action, followed by two to three episodes of of character development, with the characters just like dealing with the repercussions of what just happened um, beforehand. Mm-hmm. I, I think some of the pacing was actually pretty good. The downtime between the drastic elements, because that, that is a very unique balance you have to make. Um, mm-hmm. I was actually, I love the downtime episodes because it, it helped develop the characters. Um, mm-hmm. And it's character development that I think they kind of needed because, let's remember, these are children soldiers, former slaves, mm-hmm. finally out on their own, finally with their freedom given to them. They fought for it. They, they had it won, more or less. Um, and now they're trying to deal with what that means. Um, Akihiro is a good example of him for the first half of the season is still mm-hmm. trying to come to terms with what it means to not be a slave. 
He's mm-hmm. been a slave for about the last 10, 15 years, and he's trying to figure out what to do with himself um, mm-hmm. and how to act and how to, and how to look at how other people treat him for that, which is mm-hmm. very good character development for him. Um, mm-hmm. and I, I really like that when they brought his brother into the series, it kind of showed where he is with his brother representing where he was at the start of the series. I, it does, sort of. I, I kind of mm-hmm. get annoyed by that because I, the moment that he introduced, any, the moment that Akihiro mentioned anything about having a brother, okay, I yeah, that is exactly, true. <laughs> okay, the brother's yeah, going to show up and very, one of two it, things are going to happen. He is going to fight Akihiro and die or fight Akihiro to a draw and join the team, although... You've never seen him in any of the intro in the intros they showed. So I was right in that it was he fights Akihiro, but takes a sh- takes a bullet for him. And mm-hmm. honestly, I but here's the thing though, and that interaction between the two of them, and mm-hmm. the reason the reason I could call that is because I'm familiar enough. I, we are all familiar enough, not just myself. We are all familiar mm-hmm. enough with the anime tropes and how mm-hmm. they work. Mm-hmm. You can tell that's a trope. You know he's going to show up. Because oh, by the way, did, you <laughs> mean, did I mention I have a brother? Evil brother pops up with a mustache. <laughs> no, um, but I was actually kind of torn during mm-hmm. uh, the fight with Akihiro and his brother. Uh-huh. That desperate battle of Akihiro trying to get through to his brother, saying it's okay, I can save you, and we can fight this. And his brother just hearing the words that he left him and found another family. But even mm-hmm. then, still coming around to terms with the fact that he is still family. And the other thing about mm-hmm. the series that they kind of point home a little bit, especially with Orga. Orga, mm-hmm. I, yeah. I love Orga's design. Mm-hmm. And I love his I love his American voice actor because it's Ichigo and it's yeah, it's, 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 a- it's Adam from Power Rangers. Yes, and it's great. It's great. it's uh, John, Johnny Young Bosch. That's that's the voice actor's name. Adam, yeah, he has a really he has young Adam, Adam Young Bosch. He's a black. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry, Johnny Johnny Young Bosch. I got his his name confused with his character's name. Right, I'm trying to Johnny remember. Young Bosch. Was he the black? Was he the Black Ranger? In yeah, he was the Asian. He was the Asian Black Ranger, the second Black Ranger. I actually met him at Anime Alpha. Oh, nice. I did meet him at Anime Alpha. There's a there's a couple stories there, but anyways, not important in the conversation. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Um, with, uh, with that, though, Orga and family seems to be, is a very important thing that comes across constantly in the, in the thing with the way Mm -hmm. Orga treats the group like family to him, as Uh well as his, you know, employees, because he's trying to do everything. He wants to, he's, he's trying to become like the patriarchy of the, of the group. And he does do a pretty good job, even though he does have a lot of conflicts and internal, internal, internal conflicts he has to overcome. With the, with the oh, responsibilities yeah, that he's given him, and that helps build him. Um, yeah, yeah, it's like he wants to put up a front. He wants to put up like a, a very brave face. He wants to be, be like a role model for or everyone else, trying to hide whatever insecurities or weakness he has in him. Right. Even when other characters, such as the uh, the dude from Tewaz, he can clearly see it right through him. Right. the The interesting thing there is, I think the pacing builds builds Orga up very nicely. It mm-hmm. do, it it doesn't pull punches, but it, it does. He doesn't change drastically from episode to episode. He changes mm-hmm. in a nice gradual path. You can tell he's still Orga, but he's making smarter decisions. He's growing as a person. He's making the he's taking the firm stance of decisions. Um, mm-hmm. the pacing kind of falls flat for me when it deals with Kudeli, and I think it deals with a lot of the downtime. Um, because mm-hmm. there's there again, there's a lot of intense action. A couple episodes of downtime. Episode of full action, build up, repercussions, as we discussed. Mm-hmm. But with Kudelia's development during that, with that pacing, especially because I think the pacing was there to focus on character development. Mm-hmm. Like I know the one character, like Kudelia's kind of slowed. Was was exceedingly slow to the point I have hardly saw any development in her until mm-hmm. we got about halfway through to the to what's with- to to the Dort colonies. Yes, the and colonies, yeah. To the Dork colonies and what happens there, and then she has she has the personal tragedy that she needs that forces her to build. And even then, after that, she still retreats back into her persona she had, into the side she had earlier, where she was very questioning of herself. But then she, she, she does that less and starts making the mm-hmm. hard decisions and then mm-hmm. starts showing off that she is an effective leader, very 
not late in the season, but like three fourths mm-hmm. through the season. Three three fourths through the season, she mm-hmm. turns into that effective leader that we need, and that carries her all of the way to the mm-hmm. very last episode. In what I think is, and at that point, is a very, very good build up for her, and that actually mm-hmm. makes her character a lot stronger. And I have a, and I just remember watching her going, "Damn, you go, girl." kind of mm-hmm. moments. It's like she's she's standing up, taking the stand, and she's using her words and her actions to to bring the attention she needs. Um Yeah, yeah. It's it's interesting that like for the first half of the season she is constantly relying on on Tekadon to do you know, to do their job for for um to kinda like do the work for most of the majority of the work. She wants to help in any way she can, but She's, uh, again, constantly questioning her own self-worth. And then by the time we, at like the tail end of the Dort colony saga, if we will, um, she then, like, she makes that big broadcast that, like, she stops an entire arm, Gallerhorn army. And it's at that point where it's like, okay, she, like, her character is really going to take off from here. Where it's like, she's now, it's now the Tekadon that's now relying on her to lead the, lead the path. Right, and and even after that, for like an episode or two, she still kind of retreats back into that self-doubt of she's in over her head almost, but mm-hmm. she still feels she needs to try and go forward. And mm-hmm. I will say, once we meet uh, the the ex prime minister of the world mm-hmm. or of the mm-hmm. of the region, excuse me, she she actually stands up to him and realizes what's going on because there's also a big political game going on in the background. There's a big political game oh, going yeah. in the background that sometimes you forget is going on, which is kind of interesting um, when you think about it. It's like, I forget these it's kind of the same here. with, it's like the same with most Gundam series where you have like the personal struggle that the main characters are going through. And then there's all the CD politics going on in the background. But in that kind of pacing for Kudelia's story, I think it was very, very slow. Then it got a mm-hmm. massive kick in the, then it got a massive boot to the butt. And then that charged her forward, and she slowed down just a little bit, but then she started finishing up really, really strong. Um, but that's mm-hmm. more of her, her character development. The pacing, though, I think I didn't have much of a problem with, because I mm-hmm. really enjoyed the back and forth of the characters showing their development, showing their interaction, because that's, again, what's the main story about? Children of war. Mm-hmm. Child soldiers. How are they reacting to all this? And going on and boarding ships and killing other kids and fighting other people for their survival and basically basically doing a damn good job of it because it's what they've mm-hmm. been raised to do. Um, mm-hmm. I think so, showing that pa- uh-huh. the pacing for that, for their development, is what actually I got a little bit more interested because when you have situations like that, because you, you have the child war, you have the child of war, you have the, the fights they do, then you have how do they react to the outcomes of that. And they had some, mm-hmm. they had some really good send-offs for some people, but then once they realize that, you know, we're all going to die pretty much, they lose a lot of that s- ceremony. Mm-hmm. Uh, like the ice flowers for one of their uh, fallen yeah, friends. Yeah. And they want to do that for, for them when, when when they die. They said, no, it costs too much. And I'm sitting here thinking, it's like, well, they're probably also, a lot of you are going to die. Which right. which mm-hmm. happens. This is, this is a war drama of revolution uh-huh. and independence and making Mars its own thing. So, and Mm -hmm. by the end of it, spoilers, people, watch it before I spoil it, a lot of characters die. Not of them. Oh, yeah. Very few of them are main characters, mind you, but characters still die. And that's the thing. This is a Gundam show, after all. This is a Gundam movie. And it's, here's the other thing. Kid soldiers are dying. Children are dying. That's the other right thing. from the get right from the very first episode. Children's are children's heads are being sniped at. Yes, this show does not fuck around with it, with its with its violence. In fact, I think it may have gotten some a bit of controversy in Japan during its initial airing. And I do want to ask you: um, Do you think this might be one of the most, in terms of the uh, portrayal of violence on screen? Do you think this might be one of the most violent Gundam shows? Um, it's possible. But at the same time, when I look back at other previous Gundam shows, not counting the Tri Series, but you look at some of the other shows, you you kind of get to see people get like evaporated in the explosion 
or yeah. the suit's destruction completely mm-hmm. just get... You see them get vaporized in kind of the DBZ energy annihilation True. thing. Yeah, um, yeah, but I think this might be the first time where we get, like, more gunshots the cock- and more the bleeding. More co- more gunshots, more bleeding. The cockpits get damaged and targeted. Oh, to yeah, To the yeah. point where, like, the, inter- the internal cockpit explodes inwards and people die. Hell, mm-hmm. one of the characters... We don't see a lot of this, but one of the characters gets, you know destroyed to the point where he's just living in a vat in a vacuum yes. tank pretty much he's, be- he's become more machine now than man more machine. we can rebuild him we just don't want to spend a lot of money but <laughs> i i would have or, to agree that i th- i think this does display quite a lot of death brutality in a very, in a very graphic visceral way mm-hmm. not for a shock value mind you no, um, no, yeah, it but works it's, for the it's, series. It doesn't feel it, it, like it's being violent for the sake of being violent. Right, it sets the tone of mm-hmm. the of the universe that this world, that this entire series sits in. Um, especially, I think, I, I think part of the reason the first episode wasn't aired was because of how violent the first episode was. Um, mm-hmm. Where we got children soldiers being sniped and you literally see the bullets hit them and they their brains don't explode but blood flies out and they drop like flies. And you have them in the mobile workers, and they're getting blown up and destroyed. Characters that were having conversations just a few hours ago are uh, are they're now mourning over each other's death. They're 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 now they're fodder, and that's the that's yeah. the thing. Um, yeah, yeah. And I think it is some of the most graphic because we actually we some in some instances we see the outcomes of some of the cockpits being being hit and damaged mm-hmm. and characters are bleeding and they're missing limbs. Mm-hmm. Or in the case of one character, um, what was her name? Carta Issue. Um, she was the uh, the white haired woman with the, the white hair with, with the, the black tips. really bad attitude. Um, she just gets the shit kicked out of her to where she eventually like dies, not from like any sort of dramatic in or any sort of dramatic way, but she dies simply from being battered around inside her own cockpit. Internal bleeding, loss yeah. of blood, just mm-hmm. damaged, damage, damage, damage. And it's 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 bloody and it's visceral and it's it's kind of a little bit more real in that aspect, a little bit more real interpretation of war to a point. To mm-hmm. a point, um, I don't think that the violence that the violence and the blood distracts too much from it, but mm-hmm. it is rather surprising when you see characters that you know you've been rooting for and watching for like several episodes are bleeding inside their cockpit and not moving. So that that's kind of disturbing, and to see that because you don't expect you don't expect char- the main the main what you consider the main cast of characters to mm-hmm. die, and it throws you off. But I w- mm-hmm. I would agree this is probably one of the more violent in terms of the graphic depictions of violence and the react mm-hmm. and the repercussions. Um, especially what happens to Mikazuki at the end. But I'm not going to spoil it. Yeah. I guess speaking of Mikazuki, since we've already talked about Orga and Kudelia, let's go into the main protagonist of the series. Although I would kind of refrain from calling him a main protagonist, even though he is the Gundam pilot. I I thought it was a very interesting choice because with um, Mikazuki, he reminds me a lot of Hiro Yui and um, Setsuna Fseye from Gundam Wing and Gundam 00 respectively, in that he's a very like a quiet character, very subdued, kind of in a way a emotionally stunted character. And so I found it really interesting that because he's not a very ex- uh, he doesn't ex- he's not a very expressive character most of the time that we. Um, the writers decided to take the chance to put a lot of spotlight on other more expressive characters and giving uh, more characters the spotlight. Mika feels like he's the co-lead. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like Orga, he is like... Like, Mikazuki, he is like the gun, and Orga's the man holding the gun, where it's like, Orga makes the decisions, and Mika follows them and leads the charge. Right. And I think this has a lot to do with their past because Orga and Mika grew up as as orphans on the mm-hmm. streets of Mars, and Mika's already kind of emotionally stunted at this point when they meet mm-hmm. and when they're on the streets. And of course, they mm-hmm. grow up. He has the system. He has the or Orga and uh, Mika both have the the system on them. Uh, but Mikazuki's mm-hmm. gone through the process four times, I believe, was one of the things that no, three times. Was it three times? Okay. 
Three times, yeah. Er, only Akihi, um, Akihiro has uh, two, went for it two times. Everyone else just has it once. Right. Um, yeah, hence why those two are the best pilots among everyone else. Right. I will agree with that there, there, is a, there is much of a comparison between Mika and Hiroyuki and Hiroyui. Primarily mm-hmm. because they're both kind of child soldiers. They're both quietly reserved. and mm-hmm. and But Mika has what I call a quiet rage. True, yeah, you very true. He doesn't s- go out shouting when he whenever he's angry. When he is he's just like 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 in the like the men- the previously mentioned uh fight with Carta issue, he doesn't go out screaming, it's like, You killed fucking you killed biscuit, you bastard. No, he's just like, No, fuck you, you're going to die now. And the thing in that scene, the thing that, that's funny about Mika is he's kind of a foil. I, I think mm-hmm. it's the right term, foil. Because everyone else, everyone in Galahorn he fights are very proper and prim, and there's a protocol, especially with uh, uh yeah, especially with uh, with her, with mm-hmm. uh, God, her name, Carta, Carta. So he's like Carta. She's going on and on and on about honor and stuff, and he just doesn't give a damn because of mm-hmm. what she did to 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 Biscuit. Which spoiler alert: Biscuit dies due to her. Um, mm-hmm. he doesn't take that. He just says, mm-hmm. I. He basically goes. I don't care, and starts the fight and basically asks, are you going to fight or not? Mm-hmm. And then ends up kind of destroying her. And he does that with a lot of the Gallahorn, because with the Gallahorn, there's there's a tradition of mm-hmm. this pompous regalia for what they yeah, like do and like what they do. Supposed chival- this like, uh, what kind of like uh, they identify themselves as very like proper and chivalrous individuals. Right, and Mika just doesn't understand that, because, because even when he was challenged to a fight in the second episode... Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, he, not, he didn't understand the idea of the concept behind a duel. Right, because he doesn't, he, it's not so much that he, he he lacks the concept of that, but at the same time he calls them on their shit when they're being too over over the top, he doesn't mm-hmm. care. Because mm-hmm. he's got a job to do and he's not going to stand there for your shit. And so when mm-hmm. stuff like that happens, he dives right in. Right, almost like, just, like in the second episode... Where uh, Colonel, I believe Colonel Crank, you know, like asks Mika to to shoot him, he doesn't even give Colonel Crank the time to say his last words. He's like, "Okay, pop." Pretty much, and I I think that's kind of that emotion. It's a combination of that emotional stunt, and I think for for Mika, mm-hmm. who I think is still considerably is still younger than Orga. Mm-hmm. For Mika, it's. He's been. This is all he's known for his life is as as Orga's right as basically as Orga's other half. Yeah. For for and going out and completing missions or tasks or what have you. Mm-hmm. Right. And it, I love their their very strong like brother sense of like brotherhood between the two of them, and how each of them is willing to put each other's lives into their hands. The thing with that though that. Mm-hmm. Brings that apart, and and I can I kind of get that that brotherly you know we're bro- we're brothers in arms, but I think mm-hmm. it's also that Orga realizes what Mika is. Mika's mm-hmm. a weapon, uh-huh. but Orga is still caught up in Mika's a friend and a uh-huh. weapon, and uh-huh. so he knows Mika can get the job done. Mm-hmm. But I think Orga is still kind of resentful sometimes when he does when he asks Mika to go do things. But it comes to a full mm-hmm. circle after Biscuit's death, uh-huh. when they're traveling on the ocean, and Orga has yeah. been isolated from the group because of the argument he had with Biscuit, and they never got that resolved. So he has that weight on his shoulders uh-huh. until Mika comes in and basically calls him on his shit mm-hmm. and forces Orga to remember what they're there for. But right. I still think that Orca kind of looks at Mika as both a weapon, as, as more as a weapon more than mm-hmm. anyone else there. Because Mika's mm-hmm. the like, one... Like, a, like, like an important asset mm-hmm. and I to, think, get things jo- to get things done. Right. Mika is... God, there's a term for it. But Mika, Mika is the one who will get the job done. And Mika mm-hmm. looks at Orga as the leader and has said several times, like, I will follow if you go. If you lead, I'll follow. If you tell me mm-hmm. to do something, I'll do it. I uh-huh. don't know how much that is 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 brotherly mm-hmm. in looking up to him, but I think I think that was I think when when Orga was on that state of just mourning the loss of Biscuit, mm-hmm. 
um, basically kind of almost by his command. But in, even in that instance, Biscuit still saved him and took the hit for Orga. Mm -hmm. Mika cannot stand Orga like this. Because mm -hmm. he knows this is an, is an Orga, and Orga is taking this way too hard to the point that they're not going to fulfill the mission. So mm -hmm. I think Mika has a combination of it. And the thing is, you see Mika, not mm -hmm. in the not in the mobile suit, but just like interacting with everyone is a very straightforward. Mm -hmm. But also, there's a little bit of subtlety to his actions, even though he may not understand it. Yeah, yeah. I always I love looking at his behaviors because he's not a very expressive character. You have to really pay attention to his interactions with the rest of the cast, and I really enjoyed looking at that, trying to like piece together what kind of person he is um, because he is very reserved and quiet most of the time. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that, like, with a lot of... Um, he acts a lot more casual and friendly towards his friends because he's kind of... Maybe he kind of sees them as family similar to, to Orga because he's always very protective of, of Tekadon. Mm -hmm. But around in other uh, strangers, especially Kudeli at the very start, he's always very awkward kind of very aloof, uh, this kind of aloof behavior. He's not used to formalities or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Although I, I will say this, I don't quite think that's it because mm -hmm. Kudelia, because I, when I watched the first episode, when Kudelia arrives on base, she asks Mika mm -hmm. to show, show her around. Probably because mm -hmm. Mika looks younger than the other other three that were presented there, Biscuit, Orga, and Eugene. Mm -hmm. Um. So she goes to him and asks to shake his hand. He says no because it's dirty, which makes me think that he actually... Sometimes I think Mika knows more than he's letting on. Hmm. And even in that instance, he, he lets on... But he's not, like, super smart about it. He's just... I think mm -hmm. he's more of that quiet, observational type that unless yeah. something actually gets his attention or needs his attention, he kind of doesn't doesn't consider it. Like mm -hmm. I think one, right, of, one right. of the phrases he, he says like, is, like, I, I hadn't thought about that. Or, I don't think about that. Right, right. He doesn't, like, think too hard about things. He doesn't take the time to question things. He just, like, takes everything all kind of way, takes things at face value. Right, and he's also very – he's very forward and blunt. <laughs> it yeah. almost – he's very honest in his – he's very – he's very blunt in his honesty. Especially mm -hmm. in that same scene with Kudeli that I, I watched today, I realized, wow, this is still so – this is Mika from, from almost A to, Z, A to B. Um, mm -hmm. When he says – well, I can't shake your hand, my hand's dirty. And Kudeli goes, oh, but I think she was going to say, well, let's shake anyway. He turns around and says, well, I guess we are pretty different then. And that kind of shocks her a little bit and kind of hits her ego a little bit because she said, started off, well, I want to start I want to start off as equal, so can I shake your hand? And he goes, well, my hand's dirty. She goes, oh. And before she gets a chance to add anything to that, because she's still trying to formulate her words at this point, he goes, mm -hmm. I guess I guess we are on different levels then anyways. He just kind of walks away. And I, I don't think he meant it to be mean. He just said it in an observational, honest kind of way. Mm -hmm. But that still shocked her to the – that still shocks her to the core, mm -hmm. even in that instance. But I really love his interactions with Kudelia because you, you can kind of see Kudelia developing a crush on him. Mm, yeah. Like – not really early on, but she looks to him as a strong, as a strong, as an honest person she can, I think she starts looking at him like an honest person that she can talk with. And mm -hmm. whether, and as or kind of like, kind of like become like, what do you call it? Like your emotional rock, I guess. Right. And even then, like he hugs her when she's feeling upset mm -hmm. before they even get to the dork callings about everything that's happened. She, he mm -hmm. hugs her first and mm -hmm. she just blushes so red. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I do like that. It seems like through his interactions with Kadelia, it seems like Mika, um, Mika Zuki also kind of gains his own sort of ambitions. He starts to believe, in, seeing, seeing Kadelia, like, she, Kadelia, she claims that she wants to, you know, liberate Mars. And the more, um, Mika sees, uh, uh, Kudelia, like, act on her words, like, back up her words with action, uh, I assume is that he starts to believe in her cause. And he so gets, um, he kind of gains his own sort of ambitions, um, be it w with supporting Cadelia's uh, cause or wanting to g uh, g gain further education, wanting to pursue a life outside of fighting, outside of being a weapon, being a farmer. Uh, it's like he kind of slowly grows and gain kind of gains a little more independence, not the same kind of like more independence from like the role that he has been, he has been living throughout his whole life. Mm -hmm. And I will admit this, I love the, I, I, I absolutely adore the love triangle between Kudelia, Mikazuki, <laughs> and Ultra. I love it. Uh-huh. 
Because oh, yeah, Ultra, Ultra is being... that Ultra is that adorable level of cuteness mm-hmm. and awkward cuteness because she has the biggest crush on Mikazuki. Yeah, the and to be for, just to quickly establish who she is, she is like a childhood friend of Mikazuki's and the rest of Tekadon, and they met at a very young age. And Mikazuki has been like kind of supporting her since they met, right? Like supporting each other. Mm-hmm. And I think it is hilarious. One of my favorite scenes that I just I I, I almost bust up laughing about every time is yeah after they meet uh, a member of Tewaz. Uh, Naze, Naze Turbine. Naze. Uh, and there's a Turbine who... The, the gimmick with Naze's entire crew is they're all his wives. Mm-hmm. They're all female, and they're married to him. Which, okay, Harem, Harem anime has officially met Gundam. Oh, lord. <laughs> oh, lordy, lord. But, the Run thing for your lives, folks. <laughs> the uh, interesting thing here... Considering that I like the entire cast of different characters that Naze keeps around him uh, for his wives, and three of mm-hmm. them are very instrumental in helping out Tekken, uh, especially mm-hmm. later on, I love mm-hmm. when 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 Atra is talking to some of them ab- about you know being kind of a harem for their husband kind of thing. Her next mental Im- her next mental image they show is her <laughs> and Kudelia with babies and Mikazuki between them, and I think that right. is freaking adorable. <laughs> and it's like. Like this Asha doesn't minded. care. She gets to be with Mikazuki, yeah. and she likes Kudelia too. And there's, yeah. <laughs> I I like that love triangle and that there's no open hostility between Kudelia and Atra. I think they're all they consider each other very good friends. And uh-huh. I honestly don't know if Kudelia now. I say she, has, I think she has a crush on him, but I don't know mm-hmm. if that's a full on crush or if it's just a genuine affection. Mm-hmm. Like she thinks Mikazuki mm-hmm. is the type of person I'm here to help. You know, because she's the child slavery mm-hmm. and the the poverty and all this other stuff. Because that it, could be it. Because I think she does have a genuine affection for him. I don't know if it's if it's romantic affection at this mm-hmm. point at the end of it. But I know at least th- we know at least we know that for Mikazuki, it's definitely a sexual attraction towards Cadelia. A bit, a, like, although a I don't bit, think he yeah. knows how to act on that. And he's kind of like, I don't know how to act on this. Right, right. I'm going to ignore like, this because I don't understand like, it. I'm not going to think about it too much. Yeah, yeah, it's that emotionally stunted thing, or like, or like in terms of his like emo- his growth, or like his emotional growth, it's like very stunted. So he, do- yeah, you're right. He doesn't know how to act in this sort of situation, so he just goes forward like he does with everything else. Exactly. But yeah. I, I think there's that genuine. It's that very. It's it's unlike in any other kind of anime. Oh, right, yeah, because like the, it doesn't the... take it doesn't take center stage. The whole plot, there's not an entire subplot revolving around this. It's like there's a time and place for this sort of storyline, and it and happens when... at the best time during the character development moments. Yeah, None yeah, of it during happens the downtime, during any of the battles, any of the other stuff. Because even though the characters are still human and they have their own interests, they are still working with what they have to do. Right, priority then takes uh, takes command. Right, and so, and and, and even Atra is getting Kudelia to help her and help out Kudelia, and they're they're very good friends. There's no open like, I think even I think Atra knows there's a there's kind of an attraction between Mikazuki and and Kudelia. To even though one of the final scenes is Kudelia is, is the fact that you know. They say something to Mikazuki about comforting, about comfort, about being comforted, and Mikazuki doesn't mm-hmm. get it until Atra takes Kudelia and they both hug him, hug Mikazuki from opposite sides, mm-hmm. and says that you're the one that needs to be comforted now. So let us comfort you, and it's mm-hmm. adorable. And there's yeah, there there is that romantic inclination there, but it's not like a sexually charged inclination mm-hmm. like in other animes, because the one thing I like about Gundam is it keeps a lot of that relationship status toned down uh-huh. to where it's not a very physically charged kind of connection, but the, but the connections and relationships are there. And you right. can have the thing where, you know, the they came, like, Troa came back to his sister, mm-hmm. um, fine, and you have, of course, the really peace Peacecraft and Hero Yui kind of on again, off again, not quite relationship kind of thing going mm-hmm. on, but in this one, or, li- you- mm-hmm. uh, or it's like uh, Domon Kashu and Rain Mikamura. Oh yeah, that that doesn't see 
accumulation until the very last episode. Yeah. <laughs> um, but no, this with uh, with Kudelia, Atra, and Mikazuki, I love that little love triangle thing going on there because mm-hmm. it it does break tension, but it's also development for Mikazuki and mm-hmm. Kudelia and Atra. It's you get to see them grow as characters because you can see that Atra was jealous of Kudelia at first, but mm-hmm. then got to, got to know and respect her for everything she was doing to the point that she wanted to help Kudelia. And Kudelia even helps uh-huh. her back on the ship with cooking and, mm-hmm. and with all the kids there too. Yeah. And just to, to bring up one more thing about Atra, it's like in terms of like the violence against children, it's like what they do with Atra like during the uh, oh, the, the Dort colonies. The colonies. Yeah, about the that. Dort colonies. It's like, wow, they, you know, this series is not afraid to go there. They're willing to, to physically abuse the cute little girl, anime girl. Which honestly, I see her. I see her talk and move. I I started mm-hmm. watching her hair a little bit. Mm-hmm. Her hair goes up, goes up and down like ears. Yeah, it does. The, kind it of, does also the thing. Like her, her like the little pigtail, like little spikes of hair, kind of act as like little like puppy dog ears or something. And it's kind of adorable, and it adds to her cuteness, but it doesn't detract from it. But it kind of does help you with her deal with her with her mental state at times. Um. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, she goes through, and I honestly, I think that helps proves Atra's character, where she she and Biscuit are kidnapped uh-huh. after being mistaken for being uh, Kudelia Ina Bernstein. Yeah. So, Atra plays up the role to protect Kudelia and mm-hmm. to protect Biscuit. As, as a decoy. Right. And she gets beaten and, and almost tortured. Mm-hmm. Until Mikazuki shows up and mm-hmm. starts wrecking the place, because mm-hmm. you know, because Mikazuki cares about the people in his life. So when he sees yeah. what they did to her, he is about ready to level the place. Yeah. Without and that, again, he has that quiet rage that is just focus. It's not the the rage that's a blind fury. It's a quiet, centered, focused rage, uh-huh. to where all of the shit is cut. All the extra shit is gone. There is mm-hmm. my goal. This is what I need to do. I'm going to kill every last one of you. <laughs> very different from like the traditional Gundam pilot, which has usually been like the very inexperienced, very hesitant, um, very chi- emotional uh, uh, child. Yeah, very emo- very emotional. Uh, uh, unless we discount teen, uh, Hero uh, Yui, teenage. but yeah, again, here they co- the the com- the commonalities between Hero Yui and Mikazuki are there. So. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I'd have to say that, but even the hero Yui yells in his fights. Mika yeah. hasn't. He is, mm-hmm. he's, again, that very quiet, focused rage. Yeah, and I really like how during the very last episode, he's willing to go push himself farther and farther to where he's willing to sacrifice function- functionality in parts of his body just to become a better pilot for the sake of the people in his life. Mm-hmm. And I have to, I have to especially, I give credit to Cadelia because mm-hmm. she stands up to the cyborg Ein in a full mobile suit, almost fully integrated into the system. Yeah. She stands up to him, saying, "You're in my way. If you're going, if you want to say something, say it now. I'm busy." And I'm mm-hmm. like, "God damn, girl, <laughs> you are so much different from episode from episode one." And right. she was awesome. Uh huh. Yeah, definitely. She was awesome uh, in that scene, and then also in the final episode where she has her other big speech was pretty damn amazing. Hmm. Uh, let's see. Is there anything you want to say about Biscuit? He's probably the last uh, protagonist from Tekadon we haven't talked about all that much. Biscuit. I really liked Biscuit because he's a, mm-hmm. he's a sensible person. He's a sensible one out of all of them, given mm-hmm. the kind of sci-fi, high high fantasy kind of world that they're in, kind of thing. Mm-hmm. He's the he's the one that has like he's the more down to earth, salt of the earth, or in this case salt of salt of Mars, um mm-hmm. people. Who, it's probably because like he's the only one who has he's the like, the closest one to living a normal life with his grandmother and his twin sisters. Right. And he's the he's the closest one to actually having a somewhat he is the closest one to having a normal a normal life, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Um and he is kind of, in a way, also the backbone of Tekken for the first part of their journey, because he's the one that that tries to tries to bring everything he's like the, back. He's, he's like the he's like the brains of the operation. He is, and he's also kind and of almost the voice a bit of, of a, and also a bit of a business consultant. 
Mm-hmm. He, he's kind of everything that Tekken kind of needs to get their foot in the door on what they want to uh-huh. do. Um, but yeah. his sensibilities, I think, mm-hmm. make him more relatable because he's a lot more like the like the Watchers with a normal fo- with a normal ha- with a normal home life, normal family life, in this mm-hmm. kind of situation where his friends kind of got kind of got him in a little bit over the head, but he's mm-hmm. going with them because he shares their ideals and he shares their dreams. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And Biscuit was and still is one of my favorite characters. Um, even though his death is still very heroic in the way he handles it, mm-hmm. um, I, I still think that it it drove the story forward a lot better um, mm-hmm. because it forced Orga to come to a concern, and it also showed just the amount of stress that you know the most normal of all these child soldiers. Mm-hmm. Is the the one with a a, a family to go back to, right? And, a, and the one with a home to go back to mm-hmm. is the one thing that he has of that no mm-hmm. one else does. But mm-hmm. he's the only one that doesn't. Well, one of many, well, the most the most noticeable one that does not make it back. The other most noticeable thing is that he is chubby. Yes, he's a main character that is fat and not for a comedic purpose. That is very true. He's not the comedic relief fat guy that you would see in almost every other anime. Right, and he's he plays he doesn't play his role he plays he doesn't play his role very he doesn't play his role horribly. I think he does it very well. Um mm-hmm. The one thing I really liked about Biscuit was his arc where he found out that his brother has died. Now the thing with Biscuit and the whole Dork colony was Tekken mm-hmm. comes in and Kudeli wants to go shopping, so they take Biscuit, um, Atra no, they, uh, Biscuit takes Otra to go see his brother in one of the other additional Dork colonies, because there's like five of them, I think. Um, yeah, like a cluster of colonies right. all, and then, all like, around together. Then Kudelia takes uh, Fumita and Mikazuki to go shopping in the other one. Mm-hmm. Now, Biscuit has a brother. Again, the syndrome of, I have a brother that no one mentioned before. And he the, just so happens to be relevant to the plot. Plot relevancy, right. Um uh-huh. So so he comes up, meets his brother. His brother already knows he's working for Tekken in because there is this – because part of the Martians' disputes with their independence also goes towards the working class in the Earth's sphere kind of being pushed down to the bottom. It's the same kind of la- – it's a labor dispute between the unions mm-hmm. and the corporations. Right, and his brother uh, Saravin, he was kind of like the middleman between the big corporations and the work and the working class. But for whatever reason, he ended up siding more with the corporations, the corporate side. I don't think he did. I think he actually tried to do mm. everything he could from within the system to help the to, to help the workers in the unions. Mm. Because... He definitely wanted to avoid conflict, all, all, any sort of conflict. Right, and of course he started breaking down when he found that everyone he had been fighting for had died in the protest gone awry, or the staged mm-hmm. execution, pretty much. Mm-hmm. Um, but his company kidnaps Biscuit and Atra, mm-hmm. who who convinces them that Atra is Kudelia Burnside because no one in the Earth sphere knows what she looks like. Uh huh. No, because she hasn't done any kind of televised appearance at this point. Uh-huh. It's after this point that she does, and everyone knows her face. But Kudelia mm-hmm. herself, no one knows who she is, pretty much. Mm-hmm. No one's given a picture, no one's doing anything. So they try to... I don't. Which remember. is kind of interesting, considering that like this is supposed to be in the future, and at this point in the show's development, we have the internet where we can learn about almost everything about everyone. Instantaneously. But yeah. I, I don't... I think they get it confused, but then again, that's kind of how they, they, can, they can do some of these things in the, in the shows and everything, so we let them, sure. let them have a pass, whatever. It, so, it's a literal. It's it, you could say the big world, but technically, it's there are two big worlds. It's a solar system. It's a solar. It's not. A, it's a big solar system. <laughs> but so, so Atra takes the hits for Kudelia, mm-hmm. which also kind of I think enra- enrages Mikazuki at that point because he finds them and that's why he's about ready to just go open up a can of whoop ass and just kill everyone. Yeah. Um, at that point, so. That kind of brings Biscuit into conflict with his brother even more, because mm-hmm. he still kind of idolizes his brother. And he's still very a very upbeat sort of person, mm-hmm. but a very kind not withdrawn, but very very sensible in his in his up in his happiness and his upbeatness towards his brother. Mm-hmm. Um, 
but no, I think Biscuit is one of my favorite characters because he has the most. He, he looks the most unique out of all of them, um, because of his body shape. Mm. He's he's always wearing the hat, which is pretty mm. much his staple throughout the entire thing, and and his death. Spoiler alert: His death um, towards the end of the season is one uh, is a very heart wrenching event for everyone involved, for mm-hmm. for Mikazuki, for 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 Orga of all certainty because because Biscuit after finding out his brother had died because his brother committed suicide after the Dort incident, mm-hmm. um, is shaken by what's going on and he thinks that Orga is leading him down a very dangerous path without any kind of views of the consequences for everyone else and he's thinking of leaving Tekken for that. Before mm-hmm. that, or before Orga and Biscuit can have their discussion on that, the Gallahorn forces attack mm-hmm. or come to attack. So they still formulate a plan, and Biscuit is still there with Tekken. Um, they were going to bring, they were going to resolve their issues, but it le- Biscuit's death leaves Orga confused on whether or not that was going to be, and whether or not his current choices are the right ones for Tekken. Mm-hmm. So, Biscuit's involvement, I think, is a very good cornerstone for the entire group. Almost for this, mm-hmm. not quite for the series, but for the for the entire group within the series. Mm-hmm. Because as the series grows, you start looking at Tekken as its own character, almost. Mm-hmm. Because of yeah, all you, of the you, smaller working parts within it. Yeah, yeah, you start to identify almost every single per- everybody on board the uh, Tekadon. And you start to see them, the more you see of their interactions, the more you see them less as a, and a met less of an entity and more of like, this is, yeah, you're right, as a character uh, into a, in, in and of itself. Mm-hmm. Which is an interesting way because Gallahorn isn't played to the same extent because Gallahorn's still played and portrayed as this big looming threat. Yeah, big cold-hearted entity on on the opposite right. end. I, I, and speaking of which, I think now would be probably be a good point to talk about Tekken and the people involved in it, since they are the, the antagonists of this show. Mm-hmm. Um. So after after the group gets its kind of independence within like the second to third episode, they reform uh, as another military company, calling themselves Tekken, which, if uh, I remember right, was the flower that never wilts. Um. That's what the name um, means. Yeah, it it, techni- it technically means iron flower, I believe. Okay. And yeah, it's called fire uh, iron iron flower because yeah, it's supposed to be this sort of like beautiful thing that can never wilt because it's very it's hard as steel. Right. And part of that is because they have to deal with the fact that they that their friends are dying left and right, especially in the first few mm-hmm. episodes, which was again as we discussed, very very graphic, and it continues to be graphic right. when there's a big big event going on. Mm -hmm. Um, The interesting thing is they do kill most of the adults that are running this entire the former military thing, which is another thing that was very brutal. I'm surprised they showed this. But, Uh again, very graphic in how they did this. But they they basically took it over in a coup d'etat. A successful Mm -hmm. one. Um, Which turned out really, really interesting. And they mm-hmm. they have a character whose name I forget, but I basically called him Space Hitler because of the mustache. Because of the mustache, he has a mustache. That I swear. Who thought is. that three hundred years into the future that mustache would still be popular? I there are there were worse atrocities committed. I bet that made it come back into fashion. <laughs> um, that is a horrible joke, and I apologize. <laughs> um. A lot of the characters for Tekken and a lot of the members of Tekken are kids. They're like preteens to teenagers to some of them are young adults. Mm-hmm. And of course, the biggest thing about it is for the, for those that were slaves got their freedom bought by uh, after the after the coup d'etat. Mm-hmm. And again, that's like Akihiro and some of his allies and, and some of his uh, group of people, group of friends and that, so that brings that to there. Um, the other thing that's neat that Kudelia helps out with in this is that a lot of the, 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 the kids themselves, and this kind of shows, kind of gives a little bit more realism, I think, is mm-hmm. that a number of the kids do not know how to read or write. Right. They have zero educate, formal education, or in, almost like zero, 
Yeah, it's all they're all it, they're all reliant on street smarts. I I think Biscuit is the only one with a formal education in the group. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Aside from any of the higher ups like Kudelia, um, one of their representatives from Tewaz, no one's had a very formal education. Some Ooh. of them can read. And also, write. in this in this universe, physical books do not exist. Yep. Wait, no, they do exist. They're just very very rare. Right, right, right. The because, like the one Cudelia had as a child. Right. That had the Maiden of Revolution. Was that supposed to be Joan of Arc? I don't think so. Huh. Because but she's generally who I think of when I think of the ma- a woman leading a revolutionary or leading a war or leading a cause. It's possible, but Joan of Arc was also a military uh also a military leader. And she she's mm-hmm. often depicted, I believe, if I remember right, in armor. So I think right, it's very that rare that the, that the Maiden of Revolution is more supposed to be – because they, they use that, that term, I think, more as basically to to bring over the ideal of the, uh-huh. the idea of revolution in the form of a Maiden who sparks the revolution uh, for that. Mm-hmm. Um, so Tekken has a number of background characters that sometimes you miss, but they do mm-hmm. appear quite often in scenes um, – in some of the fights, but you still have some of the, you still mm-hmm. have some of the main side characters and some of the disposable side characters, which is still kind of annoying because there's mm-hmm. a, there are quite a lot of them for mm-hmm. for manning Tekken and their ship and their suits. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of interesting in that I, I want to bring mm-hmm. up one thing that I I think kind of gets railroaded a little bit mm-hmm. is. We have the the representative from Tewaz. What's her name? Naze? Not Naze. No, no, no. The, the woman. Oh, Te- Tewaz. Tewaz. From Tewaz. The representative. The, the the blonde woman that I honestly think. Oh, Orga has her. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like the business consultant. Yeah, the business bus- consultant. I can't remember her name for the life of me. Right. Neither do I. I didn't write her in my notes. Right. I think she becomes she becomes a very interesting character because she, but she shoehorns a bit of the children fighting. Uh-huh. Aspect about how it's not right and you can't do. That. Yeah, yeah, that was, that's played up a lot. Times. That's played up a lot when they get to Earth, right? And it's it's that disconnect because I I thought she would have understood that. And it seems... yeah, like you 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 know that what you were what you were in for when you came aboard uh, Tekadon, right? Right. You don't I... you do know what com- what kind of company this is? You you have mostly kids. Yep, in your military company. Yep. Well, and I'm you're still be, surprised. I want to be crying a lot this season, aren't I? Yep. Um, and she does because in the last, especially the last three episodes, is very shoehorny in. Like you can't do this. You're just kids. You can't expect them to do this. They're just kids. You can't. You don't have to do this. And it's they basically tell her like this is our decision. Stay out of it. And I'm like, yeah, she should know by now. But uh-huh. I really loved when she first came on board. Her back mm. and forth with Orga was mm, great, yeah, yeah. and there's that that mental sparring, which is a, which is really good. Mm. And, and another, she's like much like Naze. She's another character to kind of point out the uh, Orga's insecurities right. to see through Orga's fa- um, brave front. Just, they like they like seeing through his facade. Um, yes, yeah. I, I have a bit of thing where I, I when I watch them together, I think there's a little bit of tension, a little bit of sexual tension there, but hmm. kind of like a, an attraction, not quite an attraction, but as I watch the series more, I see that, I saw that less, mm-hmm. because I started seeing more of Orga. Like surrogate mothers? As kind of a surrogate mother kind of kind of thing, because yeah. I saw less and less of that kind of tension, I, that sexual tension I saw at the beginning. Yeah. develop more into uh, she's trying to reason with him in his decisions, not so much spare, spar with him. I really want her back to that, that mental mm-hmm. sparring with Orgo. I thought that was very good because this is also a bunch of bunch of boys who have not been uh-huh. around very many girls, and now all of a sudden we have Atra, who most of the base knows yeah. as family. Kudelia, who is this pretty princess you have fumita who is also a very you know i think fumita is, is attractive so i think mm-hmm. that there are probably people on on the ship that do too and then you have the representative who is a much more mature woman on mm-hmm. the ship 
kind of bossing them or kind of still kind of bossing them around for stuff and kind of chastising them a little bit for for stuff, especially for not having a doctor on board. Although that was also not yeah. really giving him a lot of shit for that. But yeah, yeah, her development towards the last few episodes, I think, kind of kind of undermines a lot of her mm-hmm. build up to be this very kind of point out the flaws there. So I kind of I hope she comes back in the second season with a right. bit As more a, of that. I- Right. As of this recording, I believe Japan um, is currently in like almost like ha- maybe halfway or maybe a little over halfway done with season two. I chose not to watch season two because in preparation for this review, I want to go into this knowing nothing else that's happening uh, that happens afterwards. I wanted to judge, you know, Iron Blooded Orphan season one based on season one alone. So um, hopefully by next year, if I um, if um, for when I do another Gundam month, I would I would like to bring Denny back on and hopefully discuss season two. If you're up for it, Denny. Oh, I'd love to. I, I've actually noticed that Gundam Info has season two on it, so I actually watched the first episode. Okay, cool. Because so. my curiosity got the better of me, but for, for <laughs> season one on its own merits, it's it's really good. Uh-huh. I, I do remember something I wanted to bring up that I thought was important for the pacing, mm. and it's a little bit out of order here, so I'll deal with this. The sure last is. two episodes, the pacing is all over the damn place between the two of them. There's a massive time jump, unless they oh, just yeah, didn't definitely. do episodes. It jumps like into like the the tail end of the battle, right? And, I'm like, sitting here oh, going we went through all this shit. I'm sitting here going. So what happened when they got here? Where's the rest of the buildup I've seen for almost every other fight leading up to this? The pacing's been okay, sort of a, except for the it's last. Sort of a tec- it's sort of a technique I've seen in some other forms, uh, form uh, in some other narrative, fictional narratives, where it's like it's supposed to show how long it's been. It's like the battle was so long and epic that we just had to jump to the to the end of the battle. Because I've never seen it uh, similar to Gunbuster. I think they did something similar to that. Yeah. Because I'm sitting here watching, and I'm like, okay, there's a city, there's a railroad city, and they're rushing people to wounded. The representatives is healing them, and then we start getting the monologues. Like, is this a? Is this a? Did I miss it? Did they really not post an episode? <laughs> they mislabeled uh. the episode. Is this a time skip? The she starts talking. Yep, it's a time skip. God damn it! There's so much. Because everything else has been that build, 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 you know? Mm-hmm. And we we lost that in that last episode. The last episode, for the lead into the into the fight, seemed... Mm-hmm. Re- no, it's not the final episode. Second to final. Episode 24 feels... Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, that's the second to last. Yeah. The second to, the, yeah. It felt last. rushed. Uh-huh. In, like, the first few minutes to get to the point where we're almost to the end of the, end of the siege of Edmonton. And I'm sitting here going, this is kind of bad. I, 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 And as we got into it for the time skip, I'm seeing, like, okay, this has pretty much been a standstill. Okay, I'm getting more exposition about how this has been a standstill, and Tekken has been kind of keeping them, pushing forward a little bit, a little bit, um, but not quite getting there. So it's been a standstill, a part of a siege. Mm-hmm. So I get that, and I kind of let it start rolling for that, but that I know that first five minutes of that episode 24 threw me off, and I hated it, because it wasn't mm-hmm. like any of the other time skips that we've done before. We didn't get right mm-hmm. in the middle everything, of the action. Every, uh, yeah, everything else up to this point has been very serialized. Mm-hmm. But that last, those first five minutes of those last two episodes threw me off. Really much to the mm-hmm. point where it just kind of annoyed me because it threw off the pacing so much, especially with the scale of the battle they were expecting. And I was mm-hmm. expecting more, and they're they're introducing Calahorn or Galahorn members. Mm-hmm. I feel I should know, but have never do not recall from anything. Mm, okay, so that is kind of what got me, mm-hmm. and that's kind of what annoyed me about the mm-hmm. about the piece. Um, yeah, I didn't want to I can bring agree it up. with I, that I, I as for, well. I forgot to. We were discussing pacing because we kept getting distracted <laughs> by characters. It's all right. Um, so, uh, want to talk about our? Uh, there are two more subjects I want to talk about: our antagonists at Gallerhorn and the uh, Arden Mech designs of the series. So, going into Gallerhorn, uh, I do want to start off with McGillis because he is our resident shark clone for the series. Uh, what were your thoughts on him? Because I thought that his appearance as a shark clone especially when he puts on that masked persona i felt it was a little out of place 
I mean, I did like that he was doing what Char was doing from the original series, where he was working behind the scenes at dismantling the core of Gallerhorn, um, secretly dismantling the core of Gallerhorn by working behind the scenes, and... But I feel like the whole mask persona thing felt a little bit unnecessary. What do you think? Well, I, I, I just felt it really odd because his first appearance was during mm-hmm. the Dork conflict. And I thought he was there to actually, you know, kidnap Kudelia or to actually assassinate Yeah, yeah. Kudelia. I thought he was going to do he something. he first showed up and it's like he's giving her advice and watching uh-huh. how she deals with it. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, did that needed a mask persona? Like did did would have could would Cadelia have known who he was had she seen his face? Well, because because early in the series, I think episode four, she did mm-hmm. at the farm on Mars. Um, R- oh, that is true. Yeah. So they they met Cudelia without knowing it was Cudelia. So in that instance, you've got you have that. Uh, McGillis is is definitely a shark clone in that aspect because. He's always been touting since almost the beginning of the series about Gallahorn's corruption. No, corruption and what he needs to try and do about that, but to the surface, not doing jack crap about it. Uh huh. So we, just he's just encouraging his he's just encouraging his his fam, his um, childhood friends to do the work for him. Mm-hmm. When in reality, they're merely pawns they're in tools. his big grand scheme. Yeah, right. A big grand scheme with Carta. Um, what was his uh, friend's name? He began with a G. Um, uh, Galio. Galio, yes. Galli Galli. I, I keep thinking, I keep, Galli Galli from, like Mika said, I kept thinking of Galileo. I want to say that uh, too, <laughs> but it's not. Yeah, um. and, um, and, and Ein, who was someone whose, uh, general was killed at yeah, the very, in the, at the, uh, end of the second episode, and since then he, Ein has been going on on this, uh, uh, almost single-minded, um, Quest for vengeance, or uh, yeah, quest for vengeance against uh, Tekadon. So he pretty much works under um, Galio, uh, who then is under the advice of um, who takes advice from McGillis. So Ein is just another pawn in McGillis's uh, scheme. Mm-hmm. Um, he does the pol- he does the political he has the political suave and suaviness. Mm-hmm. It's not a word suave. To maneuver uh-huh. through a lot of the politics and pull all the strings from the back, which mm-hmm. I thought came out of left field, especially right after the Dork Colonies. Uh-huh. That came completely out of left field, I thought. Um, mm-hmm. I don't mind the character and what it ended up doing, but I think the introduction was just very out of nowhere because I'm looking at this going, okay, and I, I hear the masked man talks like, is that, is that McGillis? That's McGillis' voice actor, right? Yeah, it's definitely him. It's him. The fuck is going on here? I'm really confused. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because even his from a, of like a design standpoint, he really sticks out from the rest. He is... That's... I love his hair, not gonna lie. That, that <laughs> long hair, love it. Um, But it just seems like the masked character persona came out of nowhere really yeah. quickly. Yeah. And then we find out that Space Hitler is his partner in cri- partner in crime almost, which I was mm-hmm. really surprised about because I apparently missed something. Oh, yeah, he was um, after he was beaten up by Tekadon. I know he was beaten he up by Tekadon out. and sent up. To he was sent, yeah, Gallahorn, sent up. But I yeah, don't yeah. know what happened to him after that until he shows up oh. on the ship. Oh yeah, we're Beals. not supposed to know what happened to him. All right, and that's I, I don't know how he got roped into that though. Is one mm-hmm. of the things, right? And um, what I find really kind of scary, uh, interesting, at the same time scary, uh, a little bit frightening about him is that he kind of seems to come off as a sociopath, where he's willing to. Uh, he comes off as a, seemingly a sympathetic uh, character towards his childhood friends, his uh, his future, his future fiance, and only to realize that, like, it's in a way he sort of pretends to care, but he really cares deep down, but still is willing to go so far as to sacrifice the people that he, he considers friends. It's all, it's, yeah, I, I kind of get that uh, sociopathic behavior from him that I think makes him very um, intimidating, mm-hmm. that he's willing to go so far as to sacrifice the people most precious in his life just to prove a point and to further his own goals. 
Right. So it's like he's kind. Of, he's working for the for the. He's working for the. Um, the greater good, the, but no. Yeah, he's working for the greater good, but he never feels like a like a like a protagonist. Right. He's going to work, he's going to work for the greater good and damn be those who stand in his way. Right. Right. So it's kind. Of, I'm I'm very interested in seeing where they will where season two has where season two took his character and whether or not they will make him a, a, a full on ally to Tekadon or another uh, another uh, another obstacle in their way where it's like maybe te- he will be like well uh, your purpose has been served time for you to go now mm-hmm. I don't know what they'll do with that but he did do a lot of political maneuvering mm-hmm. which is cannot give him t- I cannot give him enough credit for that um mm-hmm. Gallahorn as a whole though for our topics here yeah is kind of interesting in that it's that it's that it's like trying to police too much and being mm-hmm. content with how you're with how you're policing I mean we talked a little bit about Gallahorn putting a uh ban on the technology for mm-hmm. that bio for the bio enhancement technology um, mm-hmm. because they didn't want to use it used against them and then turn around and use it on Ein to create basically the cyborg mobile suit right which I think might be an homage to the psycho Gundam from uh Zeta Gundam the psycho Gundam being this giant black Gundam that was like two or three times bigger than your average Gundam and whose pilot was a cyber new type. Who also went insane. Right. And I think that kind of bears some stance on Galhorn being so corrupt it's blind to its own corruption and its own hypocrisy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing with Ayn that I want to mention is the American English dub version of if episode 25 is not out. Right. But the difference between chap between episode twenty five subtitled and episode twenty four dubbed in Ayn's speech uh-huh. is very disturbing. In the it's, it's very kind of there's a massive disconnect there because in the in the subtitled version he's talking mm-hmm. about purity and justice as if on like a holy war jihad sort of sort of angle against. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, Mika. And in the dubbed episode of the American dub just before that, it's more of that personal vendetta against the people who are trying to stand higher than they are. Mm-hmm. But I, I haven't watched episode 24 uh, subtitled to see if that's a similar dialogue and it just shows that he's slowly losing his mind. Mm-hmm. Probably, because he... He's he's definitely it's it's some, I guess it's a common anime trope where it's like the more they begin to realize that they're losing, the more desperate they become, the more crazy and insane they their dialogue gets as well. Mm-hmm. But the one person I do feel sorry for is I. Mm, yeah, definitely. I mean, I he's honestly very, he's definitely like a victim of this entire system. He's a victim um, of both McGillis's attempt to root out the corruption and of mm. Gallahorn's corruption in and of itself. Right, because he's, I believe, a half, he's like half Earth, half Martian, right? Mm-hmm. So he so faces he's... racism within Gallahorn's own ranks, because there's planetism yeah, even, against he, Martians. Yeah, yeah, he gets race. He, it's kind of like someone who, in early America, who was like half white, half black, you get racism from both sides of, 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 the, of society. Mm-hmm. And in his instance, he's just trying. He's just there to try and do his due diligence and to be recognized for his for his work. Right. And the one person that treated him with any sort of respect gets killed. Right. Colonel Clank gets killed in the duel with Mika, mm-hmm. and then spawns the the Ein's strive for vengeance to avenge his superior officer. Mm-hmm. And in that instance he starts going down the path of he gets he gets brought up under Gallio's wing to bring to bring that sort of vengeance down upon them down upon Tekken. Mm-hmm. Um and just the vengeance just consumes him because honestly Ein 
Ayn's goals are in the right. He wants to do the right thing. He wants to avenge his fallen. But I think he just doesn't also realize, and this is what's, what's really tragic about it, is he doesn't realize that his commander went down there to try right. and end it without further bloodshed and settled yeah. for the duel of his own volition. And, and he chose to have his life be ended so that his so that his team won't be reprimanded for his mistakes. Right. So that is So his uh, his quest for vengeance is all pointless. His quest for vengeance is pointless and not so much misguided as just misinformed. And that uh-huh. makes him very tragic because I honestly saw him and I try when I watch anime I try and do as I say, okay, new character, whose side are you going to be on? I almost picked him and I was kind of rooting for him to kind of join uh, Mikasa mm-hmm. and the rest of and the rest of Tekken as an ex Galahorn who understands mm-hmm. where they're coming from because you know he's also part Martian, but he didn't. Yeah. He just the the, the, the path <laughs> Funny of enough, vengeance it turned out to be McGillis. The path of vengeance turned him into just a freaking cyborg that Mika kills in the last episode that ends the fight right. and and caps the entire it caps the battle completely. Mm-hmm. You're right. It's interesting that like. The, sto- the season started with a battle between Ayn and Mika and ends with su- with such a with that matchup. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that kind of builds up for that, which is like I said, I think Ayn is the most tragic character out of all of these and we know we have a lot of character deaths, but I think Ayn's is just the most tragic in his entire story arc. Mm-hmm. So I, I do feel the most sad for him and how he ended up. Okay. So, let's see. Since we're at the, we have reached the two-hour point, uh, let's try to wrap things up with our quick thoughts on the uh, art direction and the mech designs. So, um, the first thing I did want to say was, in terms of the uh, color palette, I noticed that this has a lot more focus on, like, greens and browns. It feels like a more gritty, grittier version of in comparison to other Gundam series, which I think the last couple of Gundam shows, especially Reconquista in G, had like a lot of luscious color. And so I felt like this sort of like desaturated look fitted well with Gundam. And the few mobile suits that we have that featured any color, I feel like it really, it did a good job animation wise, helping them stick out from the rest of the backgrounds. Mm -hmm. The thing I've noticed with this, and when you bring that up, it is true is that, a lot of the color palettes in this are very toned back. Mm-hmm. The only kind of bright, luscious, vibrant colors you get are when we're on Earth in a few specific locations. Uh, the island mm-hmm. base where the ex-prime minister was exiled. Uh-huh. And uh, Edmonton at the beginning of episode 24. Otherwise, oh, yeah, it's, the a, city. it's a lot of gritty... It's a lot of grit and dirt and muck on everything. And, and the color palette shows that a little bit more. Makes it a little bit darker visually. Kind of funny enough, like form. looking at funny enough, looking at like the slums of Mars, it kind of reminds me of of whenever I uh, reminds me of like a, a dirty like the dirtiest parts of like Tijuana, Mexico. Kind of does. Or any kind of slums of any kind of big diverse city. Um mm-hmm. And uh, let's see. Oh, another thing I uh, want to think about, talk about with character designs, it's that um, this does have like the the tr- more traditional or more common like big eyed, spiky haired character designs. Um, while like I've noticed, I like, with whenever you have like a Gundam show that takes place in the Universal Century, they try to have more keep that retain that more retro uh, char- retro art. But for these character designs, I noticed that whoever designed these characters really loves putting, uh, adding spikes of giant spikes of hair to everybody's head. I don't uh, know. I don't know if it's everybody's because Orgo Orga has the most pronounced one of them because he has a hair curl mm-hmm. that juts out in front of his face <laughs> and swoops down in front of his right eye, which he makes even closes him his. He even closes. He even closes his uh, that uh, that eye. He always keeps some, half the time. He keeps closed. Well, it's poss- It's true because he doesn't need it anyway because the hair is in the way. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Mika is actually it's it. This isn't quite as wild and crazy as as, as like a DBZ kind of approach to hair mm-hmm. or anything like that. But it's still no. a little bit kind of up there. Kudelia, you can tell, like, I you, think, you, has you, the best the, the the best example of crazy hair. Especially yeah. when it's... When She's it's, got that Sailor Moon hair. Right. Especially when she doesn't keep it tied back. It's just mm-hmm. everywhere. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and we I already talked like about Atra's old... hair working yeah. double as emotional guide points. Dog ears, yeah. Also, um, the, there was that old man who has spikes of be- a bearded, a uh, spiky beard. I've never seen that before. Oh, uh, which, oh, yes. Okay, yeah, the, the ex-prime minister, which I always thought mm-hmm. was kind of interesting because it gets a little bit, the, des- the art design here gets a little bit more freestyle than it has been with some other Gundam series. Then mm-hmm. again, with Gundam Seed, we had the pink-haired princess who has mm-hmm. all of that freaking hair. All yeah. of the hair. Um, mm-hmm. It's really, I just mentioned that because I just mentioned how like the spikiness kind of jutted out to me because I just came off of seeing Gundam Unicorn, which everything was held, everyone had a more grounded design. Mm-hmm. Which I didn't mind that in this so much. It didn't take away from it because even the Gundam and Mech designs are very were so much more angular. Yeah, that is true. So that's we, a good we've thing had, to move on to. All right, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you we had a night long discussion about this. Yes, true about the evolution of like recent Mech designs in anime and animation in general. Right. So in this instance, especially for Gundam. Uh, IBO, the Gundam design for for the main Gundams, especially Barbados, is or Barbados, 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 Bar- Barbados. Barbados. Yeah, yeah. For Barbados is very angular, mm-hmm. but it and very skinny, very skinny, very angular, and walks on high heels. Mm-hmm. And has a and has a. It's not. It's not so much. It has like. It's like every one has a very skinny. Every one of these mobile suits has a very skinny framework and have like light armor placed on the front of the framework, leaving their frames exposed from behind. Right. So everything, all of the mechs, except for I think the the fish, the, I want to call it the frog one from the space pirates. Uh, yeah, the one that eventually became the Gundam Gu- Gucciani for uh, that Akihito uh, um, Akihiro piloted. Yeah, yeah Akihiro piloted. Yeah, um, are very angular. That mm-hmm. one was more rounded in a lot of its shape and, and construction, which was a nice different change to show off some of that. And I gotta admit, um, uh, Galio's Gundam. Ooh, it was Gundam Car- uh, Camaris, which I think may have been a uh, homage to the Gundam GP GP zero two from uh. Stardust Memory, if you remember that one. It's his very big, bulky one with big feet and big dress. Right, but in this instance, it turns it, it, it looks more like a like a centaur horse. True, and it looks yeah. more like especially a jouster. It, is it jouster? Yeah, yeah, it's true. Especially when it folds out its legs into like a hover mode for right. on, on Earth. And here's the other thing about the kind of it kind of gets that stylized version of Galahorn mechs for the mm-hmm. for their frames and their mobile suit frames. Very, the... very more knight-like, mm-hmm. like chivalrous true, knights. Yeah. Oh, especially with Carta's, um, ver- uh, Carta's uh, variation of that grunt unit mobile suit. Mm-hmm. So very, very much kind of playing off that knight feel, so to speak. Mm-hmm. So that kind of gives that. That also gives Gallahorn kind of a visual distinction, especially for yeah, that's that, true. That, that is more in their higher ranking mobile suits. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, it's actually kind of interesting in that in that aspect. Uh, if we want to talk about the mobile suits now, I don't think uh, that Galio's mech has as much angularness to it. It seems right. to have a little bit more smoother curves to it than mm-hmm. in some of the other than in, than in uh, Barbatos, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, but even Ein's mech is still very angular. Much his like, final mech? Yeah, his final mech is still very okay. angular in comparison to, to Barbatos. And the yeah. other thing is that a lot of those suits have the single optic eye that pops out, which I don't understand because it's got two optic sensors now. What the hell? <laughs> it's a tra- it's a tradition in Gundam. Right. You gotta have the bad guys have cyclop cyclop eyes. Right, but now you have two eyes, so now you're not a cyclops, you're a biclops, which means you're just human, so stop that. But... <laughs> They've got that sitting there, so it's kind of it's interesting why you have that other eye pop up, that other optical sensor pop up as the head mm-hmm. retracts. But uh-huh. but very angular designs compared to when you look at like 
uh, the original Gundam or Gundam Wing or even G- or especially G Gundam with its variety of mech designs. But uh-huh. they're all designed off the same kind of basic frame. Um, uh-huh. I think a lot of, and I know a lot of our angular designs, I think, came from like Gundam Seeds when I started noticing it, especially mm-hmm. in like wing attachments Double-O. and stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, yeah, it's with the exception of G, Re- uh, Gundam Reconquista and G, most Gundams from the 2000s, be it Seed, Double O, Age, they're all go- pushing towards this more skinnier, angular um, aesthetic. And I think that this is probably the most extreme here. Right. But even in that extremeness, it's still looks and feels Gundam. Oh yeah, definitely. And it's funny you mentioned like the whole they look like um like uh, like uh middle aged knights because with Barbatos I I always get like a Viking vibe from it, especially with the design of its of the of the uh V fin. Mm-hmm. Hmm. And I do want to say I love the 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 um the weapons that the Gundam Barbatos uses, from like the mace that it eventually loses in space to that gigantic like club chain. It's a giant chainsaw club. It's over the top. It's like a awesome. chainsaw club, a uh, chainsaw, uh, crab club hammer. Claw. It's like a crab yeah, hammer because yeah. I think it actually grabs yeah. stuff and then then uses the. It saw. does. Yeah, yeah. It Which does. I have to give credit because <laughs> I think Barbatos has. I want to I want to say the one Gundam design that goes through a whole bunch of different slight variations in it throughout oh, yeah. the show and its weapons oh, yeah, change it's got like, three, like every 5 episodes. Right, I do like that. It starts off as this like hunk of junk with like a bunch of random attachments just to make it barely functional and I like that how it would constant um consistently get better and better upgrades as a t- as time progressed. It's going to be a real bitch for any Gu- Gundam collector to collect every variation of Barbatos, because Season 2 has already got a new version of Barbatos with those red shoulders. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's going to be... It's going to, it's it's amusing for collectors to try to get every version, but for this, for in context of the show, it's, it's really cool. And I would say I welcome having an upgradable Gundam as opposed to simply abandoning one Gundam and getting a new one halfway through the show. Right, because... I think the only other se- the other series that did that was G Gundam with uh, Shining to Burning, yeah. Gundam Wing with all From of the mechs wing except zero. except Wing Gundam. Yeah, uh, wing well, Wing upgraded to Wing. Oh, Hero upgraded to Wing Zero. Hero upgraded to Wing Zero. But oh, oh, wing you're, oh, sorry. Itself. You mean you mean upgrading the mech singular mechs in- themselves? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I meant. Okay, sorry. Yeah. So so Wing Gundam got the short end of the stick there, but everything else got got basically, as I remember the story. Outfitted Replaced. for space. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. Because they they went down to Earth, so they're built for combat on Earth, and they went to space, and they're at a disadvantage. So that's when we got like heavy ar- the the heavy arms, heavy with arms the dual Kai. Ga- yeah, heavy arms with the dual Gatling guns on and Sandrock Kai. Sandrock with his extra machine gun. Uh, we went from Shenlong Gundam to Ultron Gundam. Yeah, Death Side to Death Side hell. hell, and then Wing Gundam Zero. Oh. It technically Tolgis went from to, went to Tolgis two. Technically yes, and then Tolgis three. Um, yeah, and then we had, of course, we had Epion, but uh, mm-hmm. but yeah, for the most part, a lot of that, a lot of them just get weapon upgrades. They don't actually mm-hmm. upgrade the mech, but mm-hmm. Barbatos does physically change from throughout the show, especially mm-hmm. down to the final fight where. He's in the he final that fight with look, like spiky has that spiky white armor with the blue highlights in the shoulder. Mm-hmm. I'm sure they all have technical names, but I'm too lazy to figure for, to find what they are. Uh, We're lazy and it's and, late. Shush. Yes. <laughs> so let's see. If, if there's anything I don't like about them, it's like I like um, I can deal with the aesthetics, the new aesthetics to this series. But the one thing I don't like that always bothered me are the skinny waists. Yeah, because it's. It's, it's almost. It's, it's, it's like the machinery is right there, exposed, right, right down to like the pi- the like the pipes. And I think that is still a a trend in a lot of current, especially it's kind of the trend in a lot more current uh, anime. Hmm. Um, I'm trying to think of the last mech series I watched on Netflix. Um, had those kind of smaller, thinner waists, bulkier chests. Mm-hmm. Um, for that in a couple of different different areas too, but 
they're thinning them down quite a bit, and then giving them extra armor for where the cockpit's going to be, or extra chest space for where the cockpit's going to be. Hmm. And it almost Ooh. does throw it off just a bit, because mm-hmm. it's not as bulky or built to the extent mm-hmm. of what like the original Gundam was, or any of the other Gundam variants, until we start mm-hmm. getting to the early 2000s. Mm-hmm. I did forget um, your thoughts on the last Gundam, which probably had like the least um, amount of screen time, possibly, which was Gundam Gucciani that Akihiro piloted. Gundam Gucciani. Um, the brown one. The brown one. I that was that was like it was hidden inside the round frog type looking. Gundam. Right, because that appeal. It's like, oh hey, there's a Gundam frame in here. Let's take advantage of it. Right. Um. I actually do like that one because I think Akihiro takes that and makes it makes it his own. I I do yeah. like his reason for doing for taking that mech suit because everyone thought that he w- didn't want to have the mech suit because that suit being used by the pirate is the one that smashed his brother to death. Mm-hmm. That his brother pushed him out of the way of the attack of to save him, mm-hmm. and he died in space. Um, but he mentioned that this was like the the last thing that ever shared any connection between ourselves. And so it's like a thing to remember my brother for, for, uh, from. Right. And I like the, the sh- I like the shield part of it because it reminds me of that one from Stardust Memory. Um, oh, sorry, it's the, the name is Gundam Gusion. I don't know where I got the other name from. <laughs> Gundam Gusion. Gundam Gusion. Or I guess Gundam, according to the wiki, Gundam Gusion Rebake. Or reba- reback, rebake. I don't know. Gundam Gusion is easier to remember. Rebake. Um, but no, it, re- it reminds me of that other the the gun from other gun from start from uh, Stardust Memory, the one with the massive shield. Mm-hmm. And the nuclear launch, the nuclear missile launcher. Ah, uh, yeah, the GP zero two or right. the Fissilis. Right. So that. I really like, and I kind of like some of his some of the fighting styles because some of the fighting some of the fights in here are really visceral um, mm-hmm. for the mechs, and they're not. I I really love that they're still traditionally animated, and they haven't gone CG for the for the Gundams yet. At least, extent. at least, oh yeah, the only time I've ever seen CG Gundams was for the uh, Gundam the Origin movies, which have the ones feature focusing on Char. Right. But, uh, yeah, for traditionally animated Gundams, I do like a lot of the modern HD stuff that, that Sunrise ha- and Bandai has been pumping out. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's been it's been pretty pretty cool on that aspect. Mm-hmm. Um, My one thing is, I don't know why it needs to have a hidden Gundam face. Like, it's a nice little reveal as a Gundam when it makes its first appearance, but I'm not sure why. It's, it's, technically, it's considered an aiming mode, so where like it when its ha- its face is hidden, it's called an aiming mode. So it just has that Cyclops eye, which I guess was something that uh, I believe Gundam Cheridim had or Gundam Dynamis had um, from Double O, where the V fin would lower to cover the eyes and expose a sniping eye. No, yes, you're right. That was from from Double O. Mm-hmm. So I'm I'm not really sure. I don't really I didn't really see the use of the hidden face aiming mode. All that much, but I guess it's a neat little gimmick. Mm-hmm. It's a slight transformation gimmick. I think it resembles a lot from G, a bit from G Gundam, mm-hmm. especially Shining Gundam when it goes into a Shining Gundam when it goes into Shining mode. The the uh-huh. face plate face plate splits, or Gundam Unicorn when the face opens up to reveal a Gundam face. Right. I think they took a bit of inspiration from those, especially when when the head portion reveals itself as a gun as a Gundam face within the frame Mm -hmm. yeah but uh yeah i guess overall these are rather unique looking gundams and i feel like they not only do they feel like gundams they also look very um they feel unique out of the for the franchise and are very pleasant to look at they're definitely very they are different from from previous gundams before them Mm -hmm. which i think on a very very small level, and not to say that they've taken less inspiration from Gundam to where they're not even Mm Gundam-ish, but I still see that there's enough in there to be Gundam, because especially after all the other Gundam designs that have existed, there could be a lot worse. And there have been a lot worse. 
<laughs> and we've had a lot of experimentations and variations with Gundam over the over the last 40 years. Or like, actually maybe the last the most recent 20 years with all the alternate timelines. Mm-hmm. So I don't think it's a bad idea to go this direction. It's just I've noticed that a lot of mech designs for anime and manga in the last 10 years have been getting a lot more angular in the shapes in their body shapes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and even good even luck. As, good luck trying. Good luck trying to bring the Gona Guy Mazinger Z <laughs> style back. <laughs> uh, we can only hope. But I think it might be due to the artistic idea that the mechs are faster because mm-hmm. it, they're lose because they're losing mass to make them move faster or to have mm-hmm. the appearance of being faster for their size. Funny enough, they did that in the Universal Century, where past uh, post Sharth counterattack, all the mobile suits were of a smaller scale. Although, in real life, they were done that way so they can justify making smaller mo- um, Gunpla m- model kits to save money. Mm-hmm. So, uh, now that we've covered all of that, let's get into our final thoughts. So, Denny, what do you think overall of Gund- Mobile Suit Gundam Iron-Blooded Orphans Season 1? Season 1 is a pretty solid season on its own. Uh, aside from some of the viewing that I did for it, because we did it on a DVR recording. Sometimes we would watch three to four episodes in a row. Sometimes we'd watch mm-hmm. one episode a week. Sometimes we'd like have a binge watch of like an hour and a half to two hours of just Gundam episodes. Uh-huh. Um, it's fairly solid. The character developments have been becoming more and more my favorite part. The characters are well-rounded and three-dimensional to where I think you can enjoy them for the most part for their, for their time on screen. If not for some of the not quite generic interactions you expect in, an, in anime shows, and if you're familiar with anime tropes, you can pick out a couple of them along the way, and you mm-hmm. you are more than ninety percent correct in that that's the way the that that's the way that it happens, and that's the way that it ends up. Oh boy, um, can't wait to see my dear family again. Hope nothing bad happens to me. <laughs> Why is this? It's like that's a nice fam. It's like the anime goes. That's a nice family you just mentioned. It would be a shame if something happened to it. <laughs> um, I th- I have thoroughly enjoyed this series. the The robot action when it happens is is one of those things that it builds up towards, and it is rewarding. You have character moments. You have character drama within that. Um. You have some of the some of the more interesting fights with some of these more unique weapons that Barbatos has, such as the giant claw hammer, which is one mm-hmm. of my favorite weapons along with the giant mace. The giant Absolutely. speared mace is mm-hmm. really cool. Um the the design of Barbatos and the way they show him moving for the fight choreography is really interesting. Oh yeah, um, and because, especially in re- and it really ties in well with the mythology of this se- of this series with the Alea Vignana system. Yes, they they make a big thing about that, and it, it they do it so well in how and actually how it shows other mobile suits react that don't mm-hmm. have that system. Mm-hmm. And at that point, it's a per- it's a matter of person's skill at piloting, and then you have the fact of the 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 Vignana system. And how much just better it improves because you just have a raw neural connection to the suit. It mm-hmm. reminds me a bit of G Gundam's uh, latex fighting suit. Yeah. In that aspect. But, again, it's it's pretty good. So far, the English dub has been solid for mm-hmm. everything that it's worth. That it's worth. Everyone has done a really good job in the voice acting for the characters it doesn't sound bad or cheesy or horrible. I've enjoyed the dub very much. Um, mm-hmm. Has uh, has Funimation? This is done by Funimation, I believe, right? Uh, or Viz? Because it has Ichigo's voice, so I'm thinking it's Viz. Might be Viz. Okay. But I don't know. Because sometimes they can work for different companies too. It depends on on the voice acting uh, contracts. R- I right, don't know true. for certain. Um, okay. But. Every like uh, Mika's voice actor keeps his keeps the voice very calm, especially during those mm-hmm. intense scenes where his quiet rage takes control, and it mm-hmm. just gives it enough inflection mm-hmm. to you know that it's that quiet rage. Mm-hmm. Um, the animation is spot on. There's nothing that really detracts mm-hmm. too much from a lot of it. Um, they do a lot of 
subtle things. Like, Mm -hmm. it's not really quite subtle when you think about it, such as when they're taking the train from Anchorage to Edmonton, the train has to be on two tracks Mm -hmm. because of the cargo they're loading. And when you consider that this is a world in which you've been, you've probably been shipping mobile suits across countries, Mm -hmm. that makes sense. Or large mm-hmm. cargo, cargo across countries that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so the it's little details like that that make the world feel more alive and unique. Yeah, it brings that out. Um, I really enjoyed some of the space battles. Again, space battles are one of my favorite things. It's that mm-hmm. freedom of three D movement, especially mm-hmm. during one of the earlier scenes when they're escaping the planet or escaping um to get start getting Kudeli to Earth. They yeah. use an ingenious system of harpooning a asteroid to use as <laughs> yes. a slingshot. Right. And it was ingeniously well done. I saw it, I thought of it as like, okay, we're, you're going to do this right. And they went and they did it and they kept the tension up just to the point that it was great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, I forgot to bring up the music, but to quickly make a, a little short note of the music that the main theme, like the the main theme that makes gives you that like that fuck yeah moment it feels very like Pirates of the Caribbean with a lot of the focus on the drums and the violins. Almost a bit like Hans Zimmer when he's not doing the Inception blah sounds. Um, I really do like the second opening sequence. The second opening uh, uh, song. I think I like, the fir- I like the first one, Raise Your Flag, a lot more. The second one, for me, just felt a little bit more generic. I kind of like the second one a little bit because I was... I was, I was pulling up the lyrics and, and watching it and listening to it at that point, and I find a little mm-hmm. bit more identification with the lyrics a bit. Um, okay. But I kind of like the the ending credits for the first half of the season were mm, yeah. gorgeous. Very and beautiful. very kind of almost psychedelic hot yeah. pinks and greens and blues. Um, and of course, at the very end, they have multicolored corn kernels. I and that I basically keep saying they have candy corn in the in the end credits. So it looks like it. Um, uh-huh. or it, looks or it like, looked like some elementary school Thanksgiving project. Yes, yes, it did. Um, but as far as the music, I've I've enjoyed. Like I said, everything about the series I've enjoyed to a T, mm-hmm. except for like the last, the big time jump at the end of the at the start of the second to last episode. Uh huh. Threw me off completely. Maybe um, it was supposed to. I don't know. Maybe I'm just who about, knows. I'm just, just as disoriented as those guys who can't see because they can only see in red. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I've enjoyed this series so much, and I really can't wait to finish finish watching the last episode dubbed to get that uh-huh. full to get that full effect of everything kind of wrapping up together. Absolutely. So, who would you recommend? Since this is a channel that's mostly consists of subscribers who are mostly gun- um, uh, giant monster fans that are, as opposed to Gundam or Mecha or anime, maybe even not even anime fans. Uh, what kind of people would you recommend this series to? Because for me, I feel like I, this would be an easy show to get into, even if you've never seen a Gundam show in your life. Um, I feel like it takes the core aspects of Gundam, be the political, a- the political, the politics, the uh, space battles, the, uh, the, uh, what do you call it? Ah, damn it. Um, the ties, or kind of like the inspirations, or like the callbacks to like real life history. Um, all of that can. Int- I feel like this series could definitely introduce people to Gundam for like a new generation or for a new audience. Well, I think. But de- what I, do you? What do you think? I think definitely. I mean, to give it a point, my roommate is not a, is not a very big anime fan. I tried uh-huh. showing him animes. We tried watching some animes. But the kicker for him is he's a big big fan of robots and mechs uh-huh. and giant Sweet. robot mechs so mm-hmm. i got him into this and he has been so far enjoying the enjoying um ibo with me mm-hmm. um not maybe not to the extent that i have but he has been really enjoying he really enjoys the the battles and the conflict mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. maybe not so much of the political and the character building moments mm-hmm. but Let's face it, the, we're all here for the giant robots fighting. I mean, come on. Very true, yeah. As great as Gundam but, is, that's the main appeal. But I think as long as the person you're trying to get into Gundam it doesn't have an issue with, like, child soldiers or some of the extent of the mm. violence that comes across. I mean, granted, yeah. none, of it, none of it is very graphic or gratuitous, but it is very visceral. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, so it's not something I would recommend for children. Definitely not for children. For children, something like give them G Gundam. Gundam. Yeah, you give them G Gundam. <laughs> if you got children that like DBZ, here's giant. Here's 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 G Gundam. It's DBZ with giant robots. Have fun. Uh huh. Um. Yeah, yeah. So there's definitely like an older audience, at least like high school. Like I would older. also argue that the Gundam Wing could be for a younger audience too, because they do tone down a lot of the visceral violence in that. Yeah, and focus more on like the wham, bam, pow, explodey action. Right. Which is also good. But yeah. I think Iron Blooded Orphans is a good and is a good Gundam to kind of get someone introduced to Gundam mm-hmm. on the note that this is that Gundam often has different universes that they experiment with stuff in. Yeah. Which and is this is one this of is them. No by no means no exception to that rule because this right. is a very experimental, I feel right take on I think yeah, yeah, try and take things in a more grittier approach. A, a bit more grittier, almost back to the roots of Gundam in a way. Um, yeah, I can say that too. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, those are our, those have been our thoughts on the season first on the first season of Mobile Suit Gundam Iron Blooded Orphans in this two and a half hour uh, retrospective slash analysis slash discussion slash review. I have no idea what I'm going to end up picking for the title of this video, but I hope you have enjoyed it. So, to cap things off, where can people find you, Denny? You can find me at dr, drstudios.deviantart.com. You can also check out my current work at marshallstar.thecomicseries.com, where I'm the lead author. Or uh, you could also just hang out, hang by my YouTube channel and drop me a comment. I am Draco, R-D-R-A-K-O-R. So... Um, I have been Andres Perez, a.k.a. Kaiju Noir. I've been Denny Roth, also known as DR, the art god with no followers. And until next time, everybody, take care, and I'll see you for part three, which will be the last installment of this year's Gundam Month. Mission accomplished. Gundam Fight Hall set. Ready? Ready? Go! Go!